Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Welcome back to our slightly makeshift, but as COVID secure as we can make it studio. Apologies as ever if there's any differentiation in sound and obviously the set is different, but it means that we can still keep bringing you this content. My guest today, he's back, Dan Yeomans. Welcome. Hello. How are you, mate? How are things? Yeah, good. All right, mate. Are you? I'm good, mate. It's S- spring-like. It's warm in here. It's getting there. And you're here. Thanks, mate. Scraping the barrel, aren't you? Not at you all, mate. Scraping the bottom of that barrel. <laughs> you've had you've had the big names. You've had the stars. COVID's they've, tough, they've mate. They've come crawling back. It's been tough on everyone, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking, mate. It's, it'd be good to hear a little bit about your story, mate. But before we get into that... My story... I don't have much of Got down here. This is Dan's life. <laughs> um, before we get into that, mate, what have you been up to? What's going on in the world of Nash Media? What can people look forward to? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Great times. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a struggle this last year or so. Uh, if I have to cancel another shoot because of this pandemic, I'm going to blow my brains out. <laughs> to put it, to put it, to put it bluntly oh, i'm sick of it mate i am sick of it like i feel like i get the blame as well like so when i go to our mate we're meant to be shooting in france next week we can't like literally the website says you may not enter france like i think what do they call it there's a there's a phrase for it um i can't remember now it's got some fancy phrase but you can't go you can't go in can't go in can't go there <laughs> and uh i was just like Fuck's sake, Dan. <laughs> I didn't invent it. I didn't eat no bats. Messenger, mate. They always get shot, don't they? No, he's not too bad, really. But um, no, it has been. It's been really annoying and because, like, I felt it's been quite hard to put out any, not any good content, but really we'd be like to have been putting out more. But yeah, I think, honestly, there's been about five really, really good shoots that we've had to cancel. Five or six, like, big, big trips. Like really, but I don't want to say any. I give anything away, but like really big trips, um, with all sorts of different people, and just cancelled. We've we'd been filming lately, but it's just like days only is so annoying to film. Um, I feel like more not for, not for us. Like I don't mind because all you have to do is like a day. Well, you're just filming, aren't you? Like you just set up, pack down, whatever. Like easy. Um. But for the anglers, I think it's quite hard to like really, really build a bit of momentum, especially if they're doing a session and they've got us pack up at the end of every day, go home, set up, come back. Like, must yeah, be must be hard. Yeah, but there has been stuff that have, that's come out, mate. So yeah, nothing, nothing too epic. But one thing that we're putting out, I think the first one's just gone live. Well, you might have put it by this time this is out. Um, there'll be a couple going out, but um, Anna's lockdown lives. They're not actually live, but um, what they are from the first, if you haven't seen them yet, from the first lockdown, um, he did uh, his Instagram lives and then they just got deleted. Once he'd done that live, it was gone forever. Um, And so we've kind of reshot them. And brought them onto YouTube for the masses. Yeah, basically. They're popular though, mate, to be fair, aren't they? Yeah, so we shot them. Tony, big Tone, he shot our... One take, like two or three camera angles, talk about this topic. So it was like a live and we even, well, he even dipped into the questions that he was asked at that time, um, like on the original lives and he dipped into them questions, answered them questions. So it was basically like a live. But what it means now is that they can go on YouTube and anyone can go and watch them at any time if you missed the first ones. Like, And, the, the, you know, it's not the classic, um, well, some, like some are a bit bog standard, like, Alan talking about rigs. Alan talking mm. about bait and holders. But like the one, this first one I thought was really interesting on what counts, you know, the whole stigma around carp fishing at the moment. Like, oh, that's a wronger and that one's a shitter. <laughs> da, da, da. And he's just like, his opinion on all of that. Yeah. Um, it's just some nice content from Al just waffling on a sofa about carp fishing for 45 minutes or so. And if people want to listen to it, it's on YouTube now, but it's nine parts. There's nine parts. There's so nine parts? Yeah, so they, they tanked it out. They did them, like, over the course of a few days, just back to back, back to back, like, shooting two or three in a day. And Tone just tanked them out on the edits. And um, Big love Tone. Yeah, they're out. They're out there. Well, they'll 
be out once a week. I think every Saturday, 7 p.m. for the next nine weeks or whatever. It's a good shameless plug, mate. You've done well here. That is a good shameless plug. Um, but on the positive, there is some semblance of light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, not far now, is it? Hopefully. Not far. If all goes to plan. Yeah, mate. Yeah. I feel like... <laughs> I probably sound like a bit like, yeah, yeah mate, yeah, hopefully. But um, I've got so many big plans and we've had so many big plans over the last six months, which have all just been struck down. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this time it's all over and we can go hell for leather on bringing out some cool new content. Yeah, brill. I'm sure we will, mate. It's got to be, hasn't it? It's got to be. Yeah. Anyway, today mm. we're going to talk pretty much on a whimsical whistle stop tour yeah. of Dan Yeomans from formation through to Nash times through to your angling and everything in between, mate. So yeah. let's start at the beginning. Really? Yes. Yeah. How did I've you se- get started? I've, basically, I've, seen, I've seen people digging you out in the comments going, what's this? Yeah. I do that so much. Really? I'm so enthusiastic, Dan. Really? I've, I've heard, I saw the car. My thing is, though, precious. I never noticed it until I was looking at some of the feedback on the comments and people just digging you out for going, yeah. And now I listen to podcasts and all I hear is, yeah. Really? I vow to try not to do it in this But podcast. now, now, if you do it once, I'm just going to be like, Hassan, stop whispering at me. Yeah. <laughs> that was <laughs> See, a now, good one. Yeah, so now it just sounds creepy. <laughs> well, I felt that one. Um, what was the question? I was too busy. From the start, girl. mate. So let's talk about maybe not from maybe your early sort of experiences with regards to angling up until the point that carp fishing bug, if you like, hit. Yeah, so um, by no means am I one of these celebrities or a big name in the industry. I'm not as anywhere near as experienced as, you know, the likes of Allens and Ollie. So, um, yeah, this isn't going to be mental, people. Don't strap in. Oh, it's going to be mental. Um yeah, so I've started, when did I start fishing? I started fishing. It's, it's, you know, your classic of I was a kid, started fishing. I've, I've probably told this before as well on podcasts. It's weird being in this chair, not talking to people, but I feel at some point I've touched on my story throughout. Um, but it's never all been done in one. So, yeah. A done bit, in one. Do you know what? I was actually a bit nervous. You said that to me. I yeah. couldn't believe it. You've been a. I've done On this load. Pod. But yeah, you've done a lot. But it was being the other side. Yeah, I think it was because my tragic life is in the limelight. I don't think it's tragic, man. I think it's there's a oh, lot. Well, a lot. We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, okay, where did it start? Um, it's a classic story. Started fishing when I was a kid. Uh, a few of the lads in the village started fishing. So I did. And they all got bored after the summer holidays. I didn't. Carried on. Um Fished fairly locally, just a, a couple like a little club lake and a couple of little day tickets. Where's well, local, mate? Cams. Yeah, Cambridgeshire. Yeah. Right next, I live in a little village right next to St Ives, so I'm right in the thick of some amazing waters. Um, but me and my old mate Los Smart used to work here. Um, you know, I met him in year seven. I remember it was year seven camp, and um, I was like the only kid in school or in my year who liked fishing. I didn't like football or anything like that. I just liked fishing. And I um, remember on the year seven camp, like I, I got to, I knew Loz because he was in like the form, the form room next to mine. And like, I got to know a few people and that. And we're on year seven camp and Loz was like, just talking, goes, yeah. Then when me and me dad go fishing sometimes at the weekend, I just went, another one of me. There's Hello, another one. friend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fishing friend. And I was like, I like fishing too, mate. And we like literally stayed up, really romantic. We stayed up at year seven camp talking about eels till like, 3am niche yeah but um yeah so i i've known Loz for years and years and years since year seven we've fished loads so when a lot of those early years it was fishing little day tickets and club lakes near me catching little ones and just generally going through that growing up fishing phase but i never had like any sort of like role model or older generation teaching me it was just me and Loz just going down and fishing for anything like we always thought like first of october the carp you can't catch carp there mate straight onto the pike true for a few and, people yeah yeah so 
honestly, it was literally like a cutoff date. Like, whoa, first frost, straight onto the pike fishing. Not even first frost, earlier than that, like October time, it was pike fishing. So, you know, it'd be bream, tench, carp, anything. It was never like going for carp until we were like a bit older, like 16, 16, 17, carp and catfish, really. Catfish? Yeah, there was a few big catfish in this little lake we fished and that's what it was. I guess just trying to catch big fish, but like my parents never fished. Loz's dad fish, but he'd rarely come with us. He used to call me Blanco. Blanco? Probably true to this day. Billy Blanco. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, did did some fishing up till I was like 16, 17, 18. When you were like 16, 17, got into carp fishing a bit more, you know, just going for carp. Um, but by no means at any sort of ability or level, like... It was just still the same pit, but I now had two rods, which just about matched and two reels, which just about matched and a bright blue sleeping bag. And then just sleep on the wooden deck next to my rod pod. That's carping. It, trust me, it wasn't. If you, if you walked around and saw me, it wasn't carpy. Um, and I went to uni um, and it kind of, I always loved fishing all the way through uni, but the last thing you want to do at uni is talk to, about fishing. Why is that, Dan? Because it's like it's not cool. Like it's not cool. So you sold I, out of uni. You didn't... yeah, a little bit, but but also like when I was like fourteen, fifteen, I proper got into football. I never liked it growing up, and then thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, started playing football. Loved it, took to it, and it was like my biggest passion. Went to uni, and it was all about football. Going to the gym, getting pissed, and attempting to pest women, and not getting very far. Oh, we could do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, big nose. Didn't like it. Nothing wrong with big noses, Dan. Um, no, but I, you know, it's it's not something I really divulged into when I was at uni, like fishing. I really liked it and, you know, come back and me and Lodz would go for a session here and there. But, you know, at uni, you know, the fishing stuff was stayed in the shed at home and just for the next three years, it just, yeah, massive put massively on the back burner. Come out of uni, worked putting up marquees for six months or so, six months, three or four months, uh, just to pay off the student debt, trying to get a job, and um, then went and worked on a cruise ship for a year. A cruise ship? Yeah. Were you entertainment? Jazz hands? No, a a video production. Oh, so it was video. So what did you do at uni? Let's specify that. Yeah, so going back, so that's up to the point where I got back into fishing again. So going back to uni, like, well, A-levels I started, I did media as one of my subjects, um, and then I wasn't going to go to uni. I just started doing like labouring or something after uni, um, after A levels. And then like two days before I was due, like the, is it UCAS? UCAS formed, applications had to go in. So I was, I was saying, I'm going to take a gap year, decide what I want to do. And then like two days before I was like, nah, fuck it, I'll go uni. <laughs> <laughs> uni! <laughs> I was just, I was like, I must have done like six weeks work on a building site. I'm like, nah, I'm not about this yet. Like get me back into it. So I was still going to do that gap year, but I applied for uni and media was my favourite. I'd done, like you just, at A-level, I just started, it's not like it is now, I'm sure that's a lot better now, but I just started getting into doing a bit of filming and um, a little bit of editing, but it was just on like little handy cams, like, like tapes still. That makes me seem so wow. old, but I'm not old. Yeah, like I think it was just budget stuff. Like obviously there was SD cards then, but um, I... A levels, it was probably just cheaper for them to have these little handy cams with tapes in, and so started editing. And so I enjoyed that more than anything else. Like I did sport, and I did um, I still do like business studies, um, but I enjoyed. In fact, I think really I wasn't clever enough to do sport at uni because when you go sports, like didn't you do sport? I did sports science, mate. You yeah, don't... no, but it's deep in it. I remember like some of my mates who. I mean, you choose your route. If you want to go down the tissue mechanics sort of route. Yeah, see, that's what I mean. It was, there, there was a lot of biology and science in that. Like, I just like playing with pictures. Straight coaching route. Yeah, Keep mate. Keep it easy. And also, like, back then, everyone was just like, me just studies. You, you can do that at uni. What a DOS. And then, like, fast forward 10 years, and what a useful subject to go into and have, like, in this day and age of YouTube and content creators and da 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 Like, back then, like... I was an embarrassment to my family in that. They're like, really? No, you no, weren't. No, I wasn't. But like, so often there, people just make that joke of media studies. Is that even a subject? What do you do? Just watch films all day? Yeah, and that's about it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did um, you ever marry 
filming your fishing before you got to you no so there was never that element in there fishing wasn't like i loved it but you know it it wasn't at a point back then where i was even asked about having a photo with a fish or anything like that not 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 a good photo do you know what i mean i like i'll grab a picture of this on my phone sort of thing fingers (laughs) out and that but (laughs) just like the one you just took of me (laughs) yeah yeah pretty much yeah um so there was never that connection and media was my passion for it was only in its absolute infancy at that point. It was more of an entrance into uni, extend my youth a little bit, um, go out, get pissed, play football, all of that. Um, but then, yeah, so at uni I did media studies, um, media with specialist pathways it was called, and then throughout those three years you could get more niche into what you wanted to do, which was video production. Um, but even then I went in going, like I wanted to go into advertising or something, but... By the end of it, I loved the the video side of things. And even, I think when I was 21, whatever year that was, second year going into third year, I think that's when my parents bought for my 21st, they bought me a little camera, a uh, Canon 550D or whatever it was. And that, so that's 10 years ago now, that was the first time I'd ever picked up a camera and thought I'd like to try my hand at some sort of photography. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's quite funny. There was a little lad, he come down here, his dad had, Brought him down to like meet some of the guys here. Um, he was helping Dean out for the day and he brought his lad down and he wanted to get into his photography and that sort of thing. And I was like, oh, how old are you, lad? He's like 13 and he's got like a half decent camera. And that. I was just like, you got like 10 years on me. Like, I think there's almost that expectation of people want to get re- good, really good, really quick. But I'm like, Man, I didn't I didn't even pick up a camera till I was 21. Do you it, think that can happen now though? Yeah, Absolutely. In this day and age, you yeah, reckon? Yeah, of course. You can do anything you want with YouTube and that sort of thing. Like, you can learn it like that. All it takes is just a bit of get up and go and practice, practice, practice. Like, that's the, the main thing about it. Like, I think anyone can, within six months, less than, can get to grips with the settings of a camera, what looks good, what co- sort of camera equipment will work for you and get to know your way around it a little bit. And then... You know, within a year, you'll be shooting some really good stuff. I've seen people who have just started Instagram accounts or they message me and a year later, I stumble across their account. I'm going, mate, you're shooting some good stuff. Like, definitely, definitely. I think people could, you know, I think someone could pick up a camera at 30 years old, 40 years old, and within six months a year, they'll be a dab and uh, Like, obviously, there's people who are certainly talented at it or more so like Yoli Davies of the world who've got a good eye for it. And, you know, that, and that applies to anything, but I think in terms of actually getting to, to know your way around the camera and stuff, like, yeah, of course. You don't need to start 10 years old, 12 years old. You can start whenever you want. Reassuring, mate. There's time for me yet. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I did video production at uni. Um, and so it wasn't until I got out of uni where... Yeah, so I got out of uni and wanted to go into video production. And the first job I got was on this cruise ship and it was a photographer and a videographer on a cruise ship. Bare old people. Really? It's cruise ship, mate. Was there not like loads of... It's a floating old person's home. (laughs) And I just... That's a quote, isn't it? And I just filmed them. Really? Did you not film like the acts or the entertainment? Surely there were some other young people on the the ship, no? Yeah, but right, here's the inside scoop. For anyone who's going onto a cruise ship, firstly, don't. It's... No, it was really good. But, um you get as many faces in that DVD as you can and you'll sell the most. Like, so basically the tactic was this. I have a video camera. Even then, still had a tape in it, no SD card. I'd go out filming for a day and I'd just do, my tactic was face, scene, face, scene, face, scene. And I'd just shoot someone's face and then what they were looking at. Then someone else's face and what they were looking at. And, you know, I mean, we're going around like the North... Um, Norwegian fjords and we're going to the Very Caribbean. Nice. I went all over the place, but it was just a case of old person, mountain, old person, <laughs> dolphin, old person. <laughs> and so, Ugh. but halfway through the week and you edit what you've shot that day every night because you had to um, burn it onto a DVD, package it all up and sell it to the customers by the end of the week. Cause then they're gone and you get another load of, and you just Guess repeat up, and just repeat the process. So if you didn't finish the DVD by the end of the week, you're not you're not making any money because it was all commission based, like no salary. Like oh, it was commission based. Yeah. So as many of those DVDs as I could sell, that's how I got paid. Not that like 
it was, you know, I went traveling for free more than anything. That's why I went. But um, yeah, so there I was, face, scene, face, scene. And then halfway through the week, you put a, a trailer out on the crew, uh, the crew's TV channel, go down, knock on matey's door and say, can you put this on channel like 56, whatever. And lo and behold, old Marjorie sitting in a, sitting in a <laughs> cabin, she, she's got a belly full of wine and a load of good food. And she's seen herself on TV and she's gone, shit, Bob, I'm on TV. <laughs> How do I get that? Danny Yeomans puts a big thing and visit the photo gallery to buy your DVD of the cruise. And then they go, they're on screen for like three seconds and they'll just buy a DVD. That is skills. How much did a DVD set you back? Uh, I think it was like, there was like, so there was one DVD, you sent them in a set of three. There was Ooh. one DVD, which was like bog standard. Like I made it like my first two weeks and that was just all about the cruise ship and, um, the behind the scenes in the kitchen and stuff like that. And then... So you just churn that same one out. Same one out every time. <laughs> but we brilliant. There's no false advertising. That was like, not your cruise one. This was just like, the, my ship was called the Rhine Dam. It was Holland America Line, the Rhine Dam. So it was like the Rhine Dam behind the scenes. And then there was another one, which was like your cruise. And you just go on whatever tour or excursion had the most people on it. Just went on that one. Just shoot as many people as you could. <laughs> And then um, <laughs> just sell it. And it was just you and doing it. Was, so yeah, $35 for the, the set of two. Reasonable. No. <laughs> terrible, terrible video production. But I had to earn a living. So um, yeah, there I was. Um, that was my, my early experience. But the, the thing that, that that taught me most was photography. So, oh, this is good. Um, I wasn't a photographer, I was a videographer. But there was times where they'd, need my help for shooting people's portraits and shooting people as they got off the ship. And that's where I really got to grips with settings and what they did and how to uh, act quite quickly as well. Like um, shoot this couple, repose them, shoot them again, change the settings, shoot them again. He looks good. They look like, do you know what I mean? Get some shots. They look good. They're going to be happy with them. Next couple in or go to the next table at the dining room. And I think that intensity and that, um, that constant like having to adapt to the situation, it just makes you know the camera second nature. Do you know what I mean? Like that's too dark, that's too light. What do I need to do? And I think that was like a massive help. Even though that wasn't my job, there was a couple of nights a week where I'd be employed to do that. And that helped me hugely. The other job I had on the cruise ship was basically when we arrived at a new place, um, the gangway, so as the people got off the the ship, there'll be a photographer there. And that photographer would be like, welcome to Jamaica, welcome to Finland, welcome to Norway, whatever, welcome to Spain. And they'd want to get a photo of them arriving in this place. Um, and so they hopefully will then buy their souvenir photo of them arriving at. But a lot of the time it just looks shit. It's just, <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? It is just a cruise ship some people are loading baggage in the background and do you know what I mean? It doesn't look like, you know, on a, on, yeah. on a beach and that it's just, it's not postcard stuff, is yeah, it? Yeah. So what do they do? Big Danny Omen to dress up as a Viking and stand there dressed up going, ho, 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 Vikings aren't Santa. <laughs> you <laughs> but, would dress up, man. So I was dressed up, man. I'd be a sailor. What are my costumes? A sailor. Wow. A pirate. A... I've got photos of all of this if you want to overlay. Get I've these got, to me. I've got a sailor, a pirate, a matador. Um, there was a some Finland outfit for Finland. There was uh, a Spartan. There was... Spartan was bad because I was a bit wedged then. Went gym and that. Oh, really? Hench? So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll give me a I've got this. Yeah, okay. I just got touched up by old ladies. Like, they'd pinch my bum and that. I was going to say, before you got onto this, I was, this is the start of your OnlyFans page, mate, right there. Uh, potentially. <laughs> if anyone, if it's, there's any, if there's any ask for if OnlyFans, <laughs> Danny Holmes OnlyFans page, hit me up. <laughs> hit me up. Um, so yeah, there's a plethora of different outfits that I'd wear. And the embarrassment when like... I walk like people walk off the ship and I'd be like, Hey, come get a photo. Welcome to Spain or whatever. And they just look at me like, no, that's a hard, or like just grab their kids and go, 
stay away from the weird man. And I just, <laughs> there'd be times where like, you just get rege- like a thousand people coming off. You might get a hundred photos sort of thing. So that's 900 rejections of me going, would you like a photo with me? A strange man dressed as a that. Viking or as a pirate. That's a tough gig. Yeah, I mean. And so, uh, but half the time, like by like guest number, like you'd always ask the people like, how many off and they're like, oh, still 200 on. It's like, oh God. And then <laughs> by the last 200, I've just like got my sword and shield by my side. And I'm just going, stay in school kids. Don't do media studies. <laughs> this is where it, I've got a degree, you know, like, um, but that was cruise ship life and there's nothing about cart fishing. So I should probably move on. That sounds brilliant. But that, fair, you know, mate. that was, the, that was the start of what I do. That was the start of what I do. I came out of that and I'd saved up a bit of money, bought a camera, <laughs> started fishing again. Go on. So that chapter, obviously a very mixed, colourful, but media based mm. um, time. And yeah. then cruise ship life ended because you just didn't fancy it anymore. You had enough yeah, to travel. They were, yeah. They're eight month contracts. So you went and lived on the ship for eight months. Um, I did one more short contract after that to help my old boss out like a few months. Like I said, I'd never do it again. Like once I'd done it and I'd seen the places, you're kind of on the same loop, you're seeing the same thing. So I was done. I want, it was, you know, it's kind of, you'd, people get stuck there. I've saw people who like, they were like 45, 50, 55 years old and they'd done it all their life. They'd just gone from contract to contract to contract. And I just didn't really, I, it wasn't for me. Like, you know, I could have probably done another one, but I'd seen the world, I'd seen a lot, and I was ready to crack down and start earning a living. And I think I wanted to go traveling properly, like on my own, but I just ended up spending it on camera equipment, my <laughs> savings on camera equipment. And then uh, I did, I started wedding, doing wedding videography. To get that it. must be pretty high pressure, mate. I wouldn't fancy doing a wedding, is a. It was, it was all learning, mate. It was, it was new, I was new to it. I, would, I did a lot for free. Uh, I started charging people a little bit, but it was all, it was all learning really. Um, yeah, it's pressure and I never fucked up too bad. <laughs> I left, I left my cameras once on one of the shoots in, cause I had two camera bags. Um, I was shooting two cameras, I had two camera bags. I had like a run and gun set up so I can just bowl around. Then I had a bit more of a set them down and I, it's what I like rigged all the audio on and that sort of thing. Um, like a safety angle almost and I left it in the church once when we'd moved to the reception where the reception was oh, and I've arrived at the reception I've gone into the back of my motor and gone shit I've left it at the church which was 15 minutes away they're about to like you know I need to film them doing stuff and so that was a bit scary but yeah it's a bit of pressure never fucked up too bad though um, but again got, got me the experience got me more experience and um, yeah what, what? so what around that same time period so you mm left the cruise ships you're doing a little bit of sort of freelance wedding stuff yeah you're fishing you said yeah 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 so, so where are you fishing so on the cruise ship i like i took a couple of books with me i took tales books and like so on my downtime if i'm reading or doing anything like that and loz at this point it started here at nash oh, so um, he was here he was here he'd been here quite long because he did like a, a work experience here first went back to uni then so i'm chatting to him he's like i was cruise ship life i'm like good tell me about nash tackle do you know what I mean? You're, like, yeah. as kids, not You're small. Yeah, as as kids who um, looked up to Nash Tackle, read the magazines, da 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 da. For him to be working there now, mental, mental. Because I think it's a, it was a lot more distant in them days as well. Is in there's no social media. Like anyone can just text Alan and uh, message him on Instagram, and like there's that touch. Like they're right there. But back then it was just a bit like wow. He's in the magazines, man. He's a celebrity. Like, I don't know, it wasn't as... Yeah, it's not as contactable, is it? It's not as sort mm. of... Yeah, I see what you mean. What What were your influences at that time when you and Lars were fishing, though? Was there was there your typical sort of John Wilson, Matt Hayes, Mick Brown yeah. stuff and all that? Yeah. Yeah. It was thinking about it. But social wasn't quite there, was it? No, a long way off, mate. Yeah. We're talking... When was this? 2006? 50, yeah, 2005, 6, 7, 8. I went to uni in 2009. So, you know, yeah. and like Facebook had really only kicked off at like 2007 was like the first time it come out for yeah. 2007, 2008. So there was, yeah, you know, it was miles off being anything what it is today. So influences, yeah, were classics, Matt Hayes, McBrown, uh, John Wilson, all of them. There was a, that show Day Ticket. Remember that? We used to love that, me and Loz. Day Ticket? 
Yeah, it was two guys who'd like won a competition. I'd love to know what they were doing. They'd like won a competition to host this show. Imagine doing that now, to host this fishing show. Do you never remember that? I never saw that, I don't think. No, I can't remember. I was talking to someone about it the other day. But yeah, it was on like Shed or whatever. Oh, Shed was the but channel. it was cool because they were like real guys. And it was like, they had that little bit of banter. And I, I don't know, we always quite liked it. Um, but yeah, like it, classics. Um, and then... Um, yeah, so I, I took Tell's books on the cruise ship, read them, got my massive, and Loz was to, always talking to Loz. He's suddenly out in France catching big fish and doing all this cool stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'm gagging to get back and get back into my fishing. So that's what I did. And I just went hell for leather after that. Like it was just, you know, I always loved it, but I always loved it as much. And, you know, even coming back from uni, I still loved football and fishing. I was playing a lot of football. I was doing a lot of fish, but like I was, I was in, I loved it. I was like, oh, I'm Terry Owen. I can climb a tree. Look at that. It's a 20 pounder. Mental. I live in Cambridge. Yeah. I'm proper carpy. Yeah. Well, I'm cool because I live in Cambridge. Sick. Um, <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, but yeah, just went for it. And then obviously that's when I was just like, I'd look back on my old pictures. And I was like, oh, I've got a 5D Mark II now. I can take a really nice photo. And, you know, just took loads of nice photos. And when and where did it go from there? couple of years of just fishing, just doing a lot of fishing. But with work as well, or you must have been, were you doing another sort of day job apart from oh, weddings? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, I've had lo- loads of stupid jobs. Um, I, Probably for the most part after cruise ship, I worked in travel agents for a little bit. I marked exam papers as a temp for a little bit. But my main role was I started working for booking.com. Oh, yeah. Booking.com. Good afternoon. You're fruited down at booking.com. How can I help you? One of them ones still ingrained there, isn't yeah. it? A lot of complaints. Well, good at that. Um, but I worked there for about a year and that was really like your nine to five, your seven till three or whatever. And just did a lot of fishing, just did a lot of fishing really. And that's when I started like making little films with Lars and I started an Instagram account and started actually taking photos and trying to make them look good and nice rod shots and doing all of that and started getting into it. But no point was I ever like... Um, Oh, I want to do this as a career. It was always like wedding videographer. I can charge like 1,500 quid, Lots two grand money, a wedding. Yeah. And I'll be rolling in it. <laughs> it very, very quickly occurred to me, I don't actually give a fuck about the money. Like <laughs> I hated filming people's weddings. Like no matter how much like I could have, I never got, like I say, I only started pe- charging people towards the end of it, but. Never, no interest. Yeah, it was just no interest there. Even though I could have said, stick this out damn for five years and you could be earning the good like it's terrible so many happy people having having the best days of their lives oh, oh people it made me, smile made me sick but, but um but you're fishing in that time you said you hit it hard where when what were you fishing for yeah but nothing like mental again like really relatively inexperienced to it i've been fishing at this point a long time but it was the first time that I'd really got into, really got into carp fishing. I started like putting myself, going to like little lakes near me, which were like actually too hard for what my ability at that time. But I've always liked that. And even then that was when I was starting to like fish for fish, which were just nice fish. And I'd go through blanks to catch like a handful in a season sort of thing. Um, but it was massive learning. I'd come up here and see Loz a lot and we'd go day tickets around here, go fish the river around here, but there was nothing groundbreaking. It, but it was like, yeah, it was just like my first real experience of proper carp fishing, like proper carp fishing. But that is definitely, as we'll talk about later, synonymous with you in terms of that proper element of your carp fishing. You would rather fish some low stock big cams pit for one bite a year then go to a dead set day yeah. ticket water. But yeah. yeah, that is you, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. Like I get rinsed. Like Henry's, we're just at, as you've just seen, we're just, <laughs> we're just at each other all the time. Um, but I don't know what, I just liked it. I liked the, more than like the piece and quiet. You've heard it from so many anglers already before who have do this, do that sort of fishing. Like I just like the piece and quiet. The fish tend to be nicer. Um, and it's like, I'm just ne- like blanking's always been water for ducks back. I've always been a massive optimist as well. I'm always like, even now with Al, I'm like, Oh, I just, 
what if though, Alan? What like he's going, that's a stupid place to go and film. I'm going, yeah, but what if? <laughs> what if? <laughs> and I've been like that with everything. Like um like playing football, for example, like I'd always like if I'm 30 yards out, I'll have a go. Like, <laughs> like fuck it. Like fuck, do you know what I mean? What if? Like, yeah. <laughs> people probably hate you playing football with me. It's like, don't I mean? I'm just like, nah, mate, I'm popping it from here. <laughs> like so I've always been like that. I've always been like the 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 satisfaction of something mental happening will be better than if you just you know go through the motions and you know as it were like if I got thirty goals a season I'd rather get five screamers rather than or like <laughs> if I caught one decent fish a season I'd rather that than catching a hundred which I don't really care about it's well not op- it doesn't give me that buzz do you know what I mean so it's an optimistic romantic mate it's yeah right. it's always been like that it's always been like that the daydreamer and a He's a dreamer, that Daniel Owens. He's a dreamer. Um, uh, so how did that then come to you getting the job with Nash, but also you seeing that that is a potential sort of career opportunity? Because- yeah, so as, as I was saying, it, it, it was never for me like, I want to work in the fishing industry. I just loved my fishing. Um, I was going more than ever. Me and Loz were going quite a lot. And this is when like, uh, I think... One of the first times I really started touching base with like Nash Tackle was when me and Loz went for one of our first trips out to Belgium. Maybe just before that, like Loz had sorted me out with it as being a field tester. And I was just like, oh my God, field tester. I've made it. I've made it. I'm testing stuff. It's just like, you know what you're getting like? <laughs> <laughs> Cheap boilies, mate. Sick. Um, spent all my money on like upgrading all my stuff. Cause even still back then I was still fishing on the stuff I'd like had when I was 15 Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So spent all my money on upgrading my stuff. And um, yeah, so then, yeah, me and Loz went out to Belgium for our first time. And I remember Alan, I think, gave Loz some of the new sample cloves and said, if you're going out there, I'd mention in passing to Loz, we'll make a little film or not a film, but we'll film some stuff and I'll smash it into an edit. Um, and uh, yeah, he'd give him some, I'll just put these, these, these in there, these cloves in there. And that was like the first time, like, I'd actually like properly film some fish. I'm, I'd done some stupid stuff for me and Lars like filming before. Um, but that was the first time I went to Belgium and also a, a trip which then became tradition. We started going to Belgium every year because Belgium's amazing. Loved it. What is it about Belgium? I love Belgium. But what is it Do you know what? I, I'm probably offended from it. Easy. Easy fishing? It's easy. No, the, not easy. Not easy. But the chances of catching like a really sick fish are higher than here. Like you can tip up anywhere. Like when people, like people don't believe anywhere and there's the potential to catch something ridiculous, which just no one's there fishing for. And it's just like, there's a little canal. I wonder if there's fish in it. There's a 40 pounder. It's amazing. (laughs) I caught it. Welcome to Belgium. Yeah. So it's not easy, but like, I think more the accessibility thing, you don't have to pay like 300 quid for a stupid syndicate and sit around a pond for 300 days until you catch one. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is so-and-so and and it's got come out of pineapple boily two weeks ago. Do you know what I mean? Like, no, it was just like, the only the most disturbance is there's a tractor in a field doing some ploughing. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, went Belgium and filmed it. Come back and Loz, I remember Loz, we were pissed once in Cambridge, and Loz said to me, "Yeah, mate, you keep going, like keep doing this, keep just giving Nash these little videos and photos and that." I don't see why they wouldn't make you a consultant. I was just like, if field tester was good, consultant, I was there. Mega, yeah. I was I was excited. So Nash were actually using the video footage, yeah? Uh, did they use it? I can't remember. There was one I think they might have used, which was like a little Christmas session me and Loz had done, and I made it quite funny and that. And I don't know if they ever actually posted it, but they might have done. Back then it was just cowboys running the Instagram, so they probably did. <laughs> cowboys. Um, but I was getting like nice photos of Loz every time, so his photos were being used. Um, I think I did a couple of articles in that. Um Spoke, and this is when I, I touched base with Alan a couple of times, and he said, I've seen your video, really cool. Have a better discount on your field test. I was like, oh, sweet, this is cool. And nice. Loz had passed my videos to Winston, who'd watched them but not got back to me. And I was thinking, oh, he must think I'm right shit. Um, <laughs> but then it all, tri- like, one day, this is how quick it all happened. Like, there was no, like, 
oh, they're, they're thinking about offering a job to someone or they, they want to hire a new videographer. I was just literally booking.com, hello, Dan's here, whatever, f- lunchtime, phone down, walking down the stairs, phone rings. Hello? Hello, mate, it's Alan. I was just like, that's good, that is as well, that impression. Is it? Yeah. I remember it. I, I just went, hello, mate, it's Alan. I was like, I don't know an Alan. I don't know a Ned. I don't know an Alan. Um, I was like, but I don't know why, but I'm always like this. I was just like, are you right, mate? I do that all the time. Are you right, mate? I work it out. And then he's just like, yeah, I've just got your number off Lars. I hope you don't mind. I've got like 5% battery. I was like, right, clicked. Recognize the voice. Do you know what I mean? But I was like, who is Alan? I've just gone on my lunch. Bear with me. I got outside. So I got outside and he's just like, I had a 10 minute conversation. He's talking about his phone battery. He talks, you know, he's like a hundred mile an hour. He's just like, basically, I want to give you a job, bruv. I was like, you've never even met me. This is what I'm thinking, not saying, obviously. He's like, you're stupid. No, I was just like, okay. All right. And he offered me like a pittance of a wage. I was like, done. Like big pay cut from what I was doing at booking.com in a call center. So you can imagine, I was just like, sweet. Sounds good. And I, it was just an in, but it was, is a massive gamble on their front because all they'd seen is some two shitty little videos I'd sent them and they needed a new videographer and I was Loz's mate and he says I'm pretty good and I was working in a call centre and I'd be and that was it. That is a No big interview. Call. No like you did know you we, not, did you, did you not come you must have come down and had a little chat with everyone surely or were you just straight into the work? job. They'd offered the job. I'd come down for a chat but after they'd he, he offered me a job there and then and I just said yes. And <laughs> That five minute chat, like thinking back, I guess it was him testing the waters. Like, how much is this? Like, how switched on is he? And I remember him talking about like what they're kind of looking for. And I'd like, yeah, you know, I just have a conversation with him. And I guess off the back of that, he was like, yeah, he's all right. He's kind of, he's not like a, he's all right. I work for 12 it, quid a year. Yeah, mate. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not a complete idiot, even though he's just accepted a job for nothing but boilies. But um, no, nah, so I was like, cool. Yeah, sweet. Hung up. Just got a job at Nash Tackle. Who's the man? Dan's the man. Went back up. Quit. There and then. Ooh. Yeah, so well, I've just offered, I've been offered a job. I'll give you my official notice tomorrow. Um, sweet. Carried on working. Happy as Larry. Didn't hear from Alan for like three weeks. I've handed, I, next day I've handed him a notice in like, take it. I'm better than this now. See you later. <laughs> Booking.com. I'm gone. And um, yeah, I didn't hear from him for, for three weeks. Emailed him. It's like, can we just confirm that job offer you gave me on the phone? That radio silence. Oh no! Did I dream it? Is this how the, like message Winston and he was just like, oh no, yeah, it'll be sound, mate, it'll be fine. Message Lodge and he's like, turns out Alan had been on, gone to Eurobank. So I was like, oh right. okay. But even after he got back, nothing. But I can imagine now, knowing what he's like now, he's had this massive thing of emails. Finally got back to me. He was like, yeah, sweet, come down. Like at this point, I'm not even working. <laughs> Do you know <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting at home, two week notice, and then I'm just like, oh, I fucked up here, ain't I? And I was just like, Alan, yeah. Alan. <laughs> so I did a bit of fishing and that, but I remember he said, right, come down next Thursday, whatever, come down. We had a chat on the balcony outside about what he wants, scribble with paper of all this stuff. And I just went, yes, I can do that. Um, you, but you, you're really thinking, funnily, do you know what he goes to me? He's like, right. So my first job was two things like start making product videos for every single product there is. Um, and the second one was go and make, back then we did our DVDs and he said, you and Carl Smith go to Europe for a 10 day trip, two week trip and make film a DVD, film three chapters for a DVD for France, Germany, Poland and one other one, which I can't remember. France, Germany, Poland. What other countries are there? Holland. Who did we do? Yeah. Benelux. Benelux. Yeah. 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 Did the Benelux. Um, so they were the four trips. And he goes, you'll be sound with that, with editing and that, don't you? You speak four languages, don't you? I went, huh? You want me? He goes, you speak four languages. Like, don't you speak like German and that? I was like, oh, I was lost and you a kipper. Struggle with English, to be honest, mate. I've got really good England. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, Just. So, yeah, I don't know where that rumour came. It wasn't Loz, obviously. But anyway, I've managed to get the job. And so <laughs> that was me. I was in and... For the past, coming up six years, it's been hell for leather working for Nash Tackle. What were your first impressions of Blair? Because he is, like, he is as you see him, mate. What were your, um, what were your thoughts? There was never, like, that period of, wow, it's Alan Blair, sort of thing. 
I'd see a lot of people kind of all like starstruck by him. I remember one, no, I'd met him once and that was when I come to see Loz. We'd gone fishing. I remember walking into the office, really intimidating situation because it was when like everyone worked worked here in, at, at the farm and we hadn't moved premises. All the sales people, all the graphic everyone was walking in at eight o'clock in the morning. It's mental. It's carnage. The, the warehouse was down here as well. Like, it was crazy and Blair's there with Kevin Nash and they're talking and I'm walking through like, oh my God, Lord, I'm just following Lars, like just don't leave me, Lars. Like, it's so, it really intimidating and I remember Blair like busy as fuck just looking up at me just going, all right? And like nothing more. I was like, you right? And just going and sitting in the next room just like, oh my God. I think I'd like, I'd, I'd tried to buy a retainer sling or something before I headed home so I was just waiting for Lars to sort that out. So I'd never even spoke to him then. But then my first impression of Blair when I started working, yeah, there was never that, like, because I hadn't watched all that many fishing programs. And even, like, back then, it wasn't like it is now. I think that, like, Eurobanks had had one. They'd only done one Eurobank. They were just shooting their second one when I started. Like, where that's where he had been, shooting his second one. Um, so I was never, like, you know, he wasn't even on Instagram. It wasn't like, whoa, it was 100,000 followers. It was just... Adam Blair I've seen him I've seen that guy a couple of times like oh right he runs this place okay sick and straight away off the bat as we all know like I was like this guy's an animal like <laughs> work rate mad mad like you when you first started like, I think everyone goes like it's funny when we're out filming with him now people just go oh what's it like to be full-time angler he just goes lol full-time angler people don't realize he works for Nash and like <laughs> yeah. runs a lot of it like yeah. obviously they're he's a, a, operations manager or director isn't he director yeah operations director so um big part of the business an integral part of the business and that takes up the majority of his time and every now and again he gets to go fishing and most of the time it's not even him fishing it's someone chasing him around with a camera but yeah so straight from the off i was like this guy is an animal like he's just like relentless he's going to see them he's going to do product development he's going to then he come and see me for 10 minutes and talk to me about what videos i need to make and then he'd be gone again and then i'd be like what is going on here winston who was my manager at that point didn't work in the office so a lot of the time it was like trying to pin blair down to ask him what he wants me to do for five but yeah i was yeah so i was never like starstruck or anything by him but i was like in awe of his work rate and what it was like on that front i guess what about kev it scared me <laughs> <laughs> yeah reputation or just from what you've reputation seen? i think loz had taken a couple of bollockings off him before and loz had told me like fucking yeah he's given it me a couple of times given me um so i was a bit like and like he'd, i'd heard a couple of stories of like putting people were fucking up and him, him just having it but um that's what it was like. Like, if you're the manager of a, com- a company that's successful, you know you've got to um, have, 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 have those standards and his names on it. So, um, I was a little bit scared of fucking up in front of Kev, and for a long time, I didn't really have any dealings with Kev. Alan dealt with everything that you know. Kev had put all the trust in Al in terms of the video and the market and that sort of thing. So it never really had to. Cr- Kev was very much just like worried about the product, the product development the that side of things and so I was always like whatever I did was it's like I was under Kev's radar really never really had any deal, dealings with him for a long time so it was, it was fine and I never fucked up too bad so I never got a bollocking results so yeah <laughs> now like I know it's different and Kev's not this tyrant monster that I was led to believe when I felt not tyrant monster but you know what I mean I wasn't I was I was genuinely like watch what I'd said around him like because I didn't want to fuck up but like now it's it's just Kev he's a, it's normalised yeah. yeah it's just Kev <laughs> just Kev just Kev so from starting at that sort of entry level if you like quite an early stage of, of Nash Winston was here was Ollie here when you got here Ollie was here and Carl Carl was here Carl, Carl was, was here Carl so, was my little like right hand man the dream team. Yeah, we were a little dream team because we were like almost like separate from the actual media team. Because like I said, our jobs was do these product videos, go to Europe and make films. And we had a brilliant time. Like, like Carl's, he, like to this day, like even though he's, like, he's one of my best mates, it's like, the, like the, 
the adventures we went and had as two young lads, him a lot younger than me as well. I was like 25 at this point. Um, just going around Europe in a van with a load of fishing stuff and a couple of cameras going, go make a film. He's going to be speaking in French, but good luck. It's like, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, Cheers. Yeah, and we're just tipping up at like, there's a lake next to the Orient called the Omont. We just tip up there like, I think these French guys, are th- do you reckon that's who we're meeting? And we'd just be like, they'd be like, sweet, let's go film them. And then he wouldn't really speak much English. I'd be like, <laughs> show me your bait. Point a camera at him and he'd just talk for 10 minutes in French. I'd go, got it, Carl, nailed it. Like, it was just, I don't know, me and Carl, we had a right laugh. We had some, like even now, like some of the funny memories and stories, it's just good. I always used to love scaring him and like filming him and that. And what ways did you scare him, man? Did you get him? I'd just hide behind stuff and he'd pop out and he'd just be a little bit tired and I'd just scare him and film it. And it's really shit banter, but it was just funny at the time. Um, <laughs> I remember one time, like, we were, I don't know where we were, we, I think we must have been the home straight from somewhere. I've got two funny stories, actually. We're on the home straight from somewhere and I was asleep in the passenger um, past we had this big white transporter full of fish and stuff and um, sorry Mike went um, okay. and I'm asleep and I've just woken up and looked out the window and there's a policeman on a bike just staring at me going slow down slow <laughs> and I'm just like well I like, don't know where I, you know when you wake up and you like don't really know where you are we've just <laughs> done this delirious 10 day trip where I've barely slept I just look at Carl and I was like Carl I think you're going too fast and Carl just goes okay and he was going like 100 mile an hour so it turns out we've come out of germany off the autobahn and into holland and he's carrying on yeah and he's just going mm, 100 mile an hour and this guy and i just woke up and this like placement's like here <laughs> next to my face like just going i was just like where am i not the one nah. uh what was the other one i was going to tell you? yeah so there was one we stopped to this little again same one of the same spots that i'd learned i'd come to know from when i first fished belgium um, and uh, I said we'd done this 10 day trip round the Benelux and I said to Carl we've earned it on the way home we'll stop at this little little canal spot and we'll do a night um, we might catch a mega one um, let's do it so we stopped and um, we picked sides and crashed out yeah so Carl went to my right I, I we, we crashed out quite early so the rods had gone out nice and we crashed down. Next thing I know, it must have been like 11 o'clock at night, something like that. I'm just woken by Carl Smith, head torch in my face, like, Dan, I've caught one. And I woke up and he just held his rig up like that. And it was just a rig with a size six Fang X through the face of a, a muskrat. Oh my days. Which had dived down, picked up his bait, got hooked, he'd reeled it in and he just decided, I'm going to wake Dan up with this and it was like so in my face and it was just going there and going, <laughs> what's going alive? Okay, yeah, it was there like, <laughs> and he's just like shaking the sound and I was just like, what are you? Like light in my face, big rat in my face. I was just like, and then yeah, I remember him just snipping the line. <laughs> he just going, I spat everywhere then. Just snipping the line, just hitting the deck, bam, and just went <laughs> straight into the, oh. you know, and went. And I was like, thanks, Carl. I'm awake now, Carl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Didn't sleep again. Um, but yeah, that was that was funny. There's loads of little stories and little funny bits. Like, yeah. He's a character though. But both Love of you him. sort of at that, it's an early stage. You might have been different in age, but you were pretty early in terms of the industry, but spot on in terms of timing, media-wise, marketing-wise, mm. and, and that whole sort of spike and upturn in that. Yeah, it already started. Yeah. I was like bolstering the team. I was like fourth member in the team. I was bolstering the team. So it already, it was well on its way by this point. But and yeah. then how did that, because well, obviously, I mean, both of you are incredibly talented. He's obviously gone on with his bro to, to do what they do now, which is mega content. You've obviously gone on to the position. How did that all sort of progress to the point where now you you are head of marketing and media? Well, media, aren't you? I am. God knows how. Um, how did it progress? Um just carried on making films like we just carried on um winston went uh carl then started running the media team alex joined lou porter joined team got bigger but always i think because me and carl when i started me and carl were always like that i say we were this little duo 
Ollie never edited, so he was always just a shooter and a photographer. Um, and as Carl moved up to media manager, I went up to photography manager. Um, I okay. think they were just trying to keep me happy, to be honest. Give him a manager title. Yeah, just chuck him a manager title. But, um, no, so I looked after all the, the imagery side of things. Carl did all the video side of things. But we ended up, Carl was m- the manager, but we worked very closely together. Carl was an incredible creative and planning a shoot and planning a story and making it happen and the edit and all that. He's Him and his brother are phenomenal at I'm a very organized guy. So combined, like Carl's not as organized. I say that he's actually fucking regimented looking what he's done now. But at that time, we kind of just helped each other out. I it let him, I guess I let him concentrate on the, the video side of things. And I helped with the organizer. Like I knew what products were coming out and when, and what videos we needed to make or like what we needed to promote and this sort of thing. So we worked very coherently as a team. I'm sure everyone knows um yeah so that went for a, went on for a little bit but there was that period where I think we knew they were gonna thinking about going um Carl had a few mental health issues um he got through it which is brilliant but at that point it was too much for him I know he's been very open about this in his podcast with Corder and that um and he just went too many too many things on my plate I'm gonna go hell for leather on the right decision, health for everyone, what he, and it's always what he wanted to do. So him and his brother left and I then was the manager. What was that like in terms of for you? Because obviously you've been through a bit of a journey there mm. with him and him going. But not really, like shame that he went, but like, like I say, we kind of did it together anyway. We kind of like, man, like he was the manager, but like we both had our, it was like an unwritten agreement of like i'll look after this stuff you look after that stuff or like i'll help you with this and you we just, yeah so it was all right like um most of all like when they left i wasn't gutted at all like there's people there's some people who have left and i've gone like oh, that's that's gutting it's a shame they've left like um even who's, recent- that? who's that who are you gutted about yeomans that i can't actually say there's someone who recently um Almost left. Oh, yeah, yeah. Someone who recently almost left. And when I got told they were leaving, I was gutted. Like, genuinely, like I'd just been dumped or something. Like, I had that feeling in my stomach, gutted. But they didn't. We spoke to them and just said, you should stay. It'd be fun. And they went, oh, yeah, sorted. And so... (laughs) Just like that. They just went, oh, yeah, it will be fun. (laughs) Um, No, but, you know, and... But with them, I was never gutted because I knew, like, this is going to sound right soppy, but I knew it's what they should be doing and what he wanted to be doing and what's best for them. And Jesus Christ, look at them now. Like, they're, they're smashing it. So, Great, cool. I was never, yeah, I was never gutted. I was never just like, I was stressed. Yeah. Because, like, the, like, literally, like, two of the best video producers in the industry have just left. And I was just like, now what do I do? <laughs> but I've got nothing left. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it was a, a, a bad like year or so in terms of people leaving and trying to rebolster the team and a lot on and Alan's expectations of make a million films this year and I can't. <laughs> There's only so many like do you know what I mean? So it was like it was a stressful couple of years, but yeah, it was it was good. But you were a grafter, mate, by your nature, just like you complimented Al, mate. I've seen you yeah, in the time that I've been here, which has not been a long period of time, but you do an awful lot of graft, mate, and you are good at what you do mate which is why you've what's, got to where you got what's the saying uh art hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard so I just work hard nice. it's always been in me though i think like i think i've said it before it's all down to my mum making me go and pick the lettuces when i was like 12 years old she made you pick the lettuces yeah so when i was like 12 she was like you need to get out and earn yourself a living i was like, i'm 12 mum let me go play football let me go fishing and uh, saturday mornings i had to go and pick lettuce and plant lettuce as well, not just picking, planting lettuce for two pound fifty an hour. Um, so for like six hours on a Saturday morning, I go and do that. And now I realise, like it's from that young age, it's instilled like a good work ethic in me. And I've I got nothing for free, sort of thing. Like if I wanted to buy something, you had to. Don't get me wrong, like it weren't I wasn't like abused as a child, but <laughs> it was. I always look back, and I've said, like, said to my parents since, like that sorted me out. That's 
that gave me a good mindset when it come to um work work and 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 whatnot so i've always been like that since just graft it out big love mommy yeomans go on well diane done. diane sometimes she, oh she sometimes she i don't know if she'll listen to this she don't they, they my mom and dad never have seen anything that i've made or anything like that like dead supportive but they they're not going to watch fishing program um she sometimes she sometimes comments on my uh nash instagram and i just have to delete the comment she's bare embarrassing what does she put what's it, the most embarrassing comment diana's put on I your i can't nash remember instagram. word for word but she definitely did she did something recently I think it was like so maybe Gaz Gaz Ferrum had commented on a post and she'd like reply to him and I was just like, Mum, that's Gaz Ferrum. He is my idol. He is my idol. <laughs> Delete. Ringer. Everything that Get I'm off about the wine <laughs> is thanks to that man. <laughs> so um nah, she's all right. Bless her. Yeah. Right. We've gone through a fair progression there in terms of Nash years. Yeah. Stripping back, let's talk about some of you fishing. You mentioned Belgium and your affinity for all things Belgium, chocolate, waffles. I don't like to boast, but they call me Dan Belgerian. <laughs> same lifestyle. Exactly the same lifestyle. Pretty, pretty much the same, yeah. Um, uh, they don't call me that, no. I got called it once and I've tried ever since to make it my nickname. It hasn't stuck. Maybe after this podcast. Yeah. That, that's not. the name of the podcast, Dan Belgerian. There we go. Also, disclaimer, Mark Vrooshin is going to absolutely fucking rinse me for this because it, like, whenever I put a post up about Belgium, talk about Belgium, anything about Belgium, he's all like, ew, Belgium. Because it's all fancy and artsy and, oh, look at us in Belgium. He's like, just come over to Germany and do some real man's fishing. I've actually come to bad. see that over the short period of time that people have talked to me from the inside about Mark Vusen, I'm worried about a potential podcast that I'm going to do with Mark because he is savage, mate, isn't he? He's not. He's an absolute fucking gent. He's a beautiful man. He's just a legend. He's, he's just so good. good. He's just good. He's just good. Yeah, he's a machine. Uh, so Belgium, mate. Talk Belgium, to me. Yeah, so I started fishing Belgium like 2014, 2015, I can't remember which. Um, went over with Loz and Loz had the contact there called Yella legend um who was part of the nash team and he's the person like me and Loz need to thank for every single trip like he's the one who instilled that fight like he was you know he welcomed us. he didn't know either of us i think he met like Loz like once at a show and then he just welcomed us both in and was just like come on meds i'll show you where to fish and i was just like sick and he just looked after us year after year after year until the pandemic every year we go and see him and he's absolutely sorted us out so big ups, Yale, if you listen to this. Um, but yeah, we went and met Yale and we fished this cool, like there's, there's been a lot of trips. So I'll try not to waffle on about all of them. But the first trip over was like that massive sense of adventure. Do you know what I mean? Me and, me and Loz in that, my little mop, whatever, golf. Um, fishing crammed, fishing stuff crammed in. And we, we drove down there. After I picked Loz up from here after work on a Friday and we drove down June the 16th it was summer vibes like really nice day windows down like lads on tour and it's the first time like even when we were young well, obviously we never fished in france or anything when we were younger but um this was like the first time we fished on in belgium and it was just like the sense of buzzing and i, I hate to use the word buzzing so much but like that sense of adventure the sense of buzzing the sense like in your stomach of like what could happen it was just so like liberating i want to say do you know what i mean it was just like what you know so we went down there and we went to we met yo at this <laughs> met, met, met yo at this park lake and like, i remember like peering through that he told me like told us where to park and then where to walk i remember looking through some bushes and seeing him and Loz going i think that's him but i'm not sure but i think it's him and we we're basically <laughs> watching him through like peeping toms watching him through these bushes and we just went we're gonna have to just walk up to this random belgian man and go hello and hope he recognises us because Loz was like, I'm pretty sure it's him. I'm not 100%. So, um, <laughs> what a call. Yeah. So we went, it was him. Um, we fished this big park lake, like 70 acres for two nights. Skip over it a little bit here. Um, Loz had a nice one for like 30 pounder. First Belgian fish. It was amazing. Wicked. Go on, Loz. 
Um, upon leave, this is cool. But upon leaving, because yeah, was just like he's so like nonchalant about it. Always just like yeah, we could fish here. And then, like at this point, I'm like, this is amazing. This is sick fishing. This is wicked. Like loads of caught thirty pounders. We're on it. And he's like, we can go to this canal for a couple of nights. You said you wanted to fish a Belgian canal. He's like, yeah, sweet. But, oh, this looks quite good. And Loz had one last night. Why would we pack up? And he's like, oh, no, nah, come on, let's go. And didn't really say much more about it. Anyway, we're packing up. And at this little bay, there's like this tiny little spit off this um, 70 acres, like 30 yards across. Uh, went deep quite quick. Excuse me. Went deep quite quick, but also very clear. So you could see quite a lot. And I'm walking around back to, the, we're taking it turns doing shuttle runs to the van so someone could stay with the stuff. And I'm walking around, I've just looked down and there's like this pod of like five fish or like 30 plus. And I was just like, oh my God, there's fish. <laughs> Me and Loz also decided we'll fish run for run, flipped a coin. We both put, no, we didn't. We we put our, both put our rods out. First rod to go is theirs. Then we'll do run to run from then. Um, just because we, like, if you're going out there and you've got four days and someone's all what, just hammering them. You both just, want to yeah. catch, didn't you? But we do it as though first person who gets a fish, first run is they're the, whoever's rod goes first, it's them. Then it's run for run, but it's run for run as in the person who's run it is, they do the four rods. So there's no element of, oh, I've just reeled it in on his rod sort of thing. Like they do the four rods, they fish how they want to fish sort of thing. Um, Anyway, I'm walking around, it's my run and there's fucking, there's this group of like 30 pounders. So I've just like, Lars, get the rods. I've found them. <laughs> and so like gone running back round, grabbed her the rods, bait still on them, dropped them in the edge, sat back. And like, at the, like we're still going. So at this point, Loz is like, keeps creeping past me. Going, and he's like, they come back. I'm like, no, I've not seen them yet. And like, he's t- going up to the car. He loads some stuff into the car, comes back. He's like, they're back yet? No, I've not seen them yet. But I can see my hook baits. And um, anyway, he's gone. I see these, fish creep in I feel it see this one like common like upper 20s maybe low 30s and he's just tipped up on the hook bait he's down he's down he's down I had uh, I remember now it was a 4G squid 20 mil bottom bait and a little um, white topper little citrus topper probably and just tipped down sucked it up shaking his head I'm running the spool and um, now that no this is it the spool didn't go like it's shaking its head. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in. I'm like, literally, I was about to grab the rod, and then I just see the um, the white no. the white tipper, no, like just fl- fluttering down. This carp's like, and just gone. I was just like, no. And then like it was like a second, and I was just like, no. Rod's just gone. Zzz. It was hooked. The t- as he's shaking, the tipper had come off, but oh. I thought it was my rig coming out of his mouth because I could only just make out the color of it, and it's fluttering down, and this. Carp's gone, and the you know the spool at this point. Zzz, he's got twenty yards on me now, so I'm like, it hit it. I'm fucking. I'm trying to bring him back, bring him back, and it was just great, 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 great. Like like I say, it was only 20, 30 yards across, and he's just straight through snags on the far side. Great, 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 great snap. Oh no! And the boys have come down, like just see me, like on my knees, snapped up, like I lost one. Um, Snitty and Mikey moment, mate. Yeah. So anyway, like we went off to this canal. And this canal then became my favourite venue I've ever fished in, in my life. Um, like I say, I wasn't too fussed about going to this canal. Um, yeah, we'd just be like, yeah, we'll just go to a canal, mate. We'll catch a few. There might be, you know, there's a few nice ones in there. All chilled and that. And he's got there. He's like, yeah, so this is it, mate. It's like a thousand metres long, locked off at both ends, 30 yards wide, underarm chucks. Um, yeah, last time I was here, like average size is 10 to 15 kilos. So... 22 to 33, 35 pound. That'll do. Take that. Yeah, sweet. And he goes, yeah, there's, you know, big common does like 45 pound. Big mirror does like 48 pound. I was like, what in this tiny little bit of what, like this lap we're going to do, we'll be walking right past it as in 30 yards away. Like he was just like, yeah, mate, last time I was here, I had like 14 fish. Biggest was like 42. I was just like, heaven. What the fuck is going on? Do you know what I mean? Like, why is this not in England? No one else there. And this was like, call it Canal 7, like Lock 8 and 7 of like 20. And then obviously below it, there's another stretch of 400 metres, probably carp in there. Another stretch below that of like 1,000 metres. And they're just everywhere. And he was just like, yeah, just there's ZZ's Park on this one. So we just fish here. Or there might be a few more. And it was just like, okay, so this is what Belgian fishing is like. Within... I don't know, an hour, Loz had had one, little 20 pounder, mega, wicked one. 
Um, no, it was me. It was my run. So I'd had, I'd had one within an hour. Loz had had one um, within another hour. Some dude had turned up on a moped, like, and some shitty, like, cane rod and just flicked it in. He's like, I've been baiting with maids, mate. Like, Where's he from, mate? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wherever, wherever that sounded like. <laughs> Scotland. Um, he's just um, flicked it in. He had a £38 common. Wow. I was just like, this play. And he, he was done then. So like, guys, enjoy your night's fishing. Gone. In and out. Might have been Blair on a bike there. Yeah, it might have been. Um, but, which was one of the known fish of the stretch. That is quite a big one for the stretch. So, yeah, this play, like, you know, I went on to have a, a 30 pounder, uh, 30 pound common. Um, so we did two nights. We had four fish, two each. Went home, smile on the face. Uh, two nights, three nights, three or four nights. I can't remember now. Uh, but yeah, when can we go back sort of thing? Amazing. Yeah, so from there... From there on out, like that canal became our little pit stop whenever we went to Europe and whenever there was an opportunity to go to a show or go and help out somewhere in Europe, me and Loz were like, we'll do it. We'll, we'll go a day early. We'll, li- we'll leave the night before, you know, be safe on the drive-in and we'll go and do a night on the canal. Take one for the team. Yeah, mate. So, and it became like a proper little campaign because we knew the target fish that we wanted to catch because we'd seen Yale would caught what he'd caught. He'd, he was done with it. He'd caught, he'd caught everything he wanted to catch out there. Um, and so it became a right little campaign for us, like over in Belgium. It was our little target water. Um, the best thing about it, I just remember sitting on that last night on that first session, sun going down, like I say, a little tractor chugging away. No, no one for miles. Like we sat on one side and you could see the occasional dog walk on the far side. No one came across our side. It was really rare to see that mate who caught that common. Never saw anyone else fishing it. We just sat there like, this is mental. This is actually mental. If there was someone, if this was in the UK, bivvies everywhere, slams every night, fish dead spooky, but like, you just had to be on them. Do you know what I mean? Like, you just, I think that night, like all those two days, we'd only fished an area, blank the night, moved up, caught them, and they tend to move up after you've caught them. So it was like, I'm full of boilies over the top and a, like just a bottom bait rig. Like, do you know what I mean? It was just simple fishing, underarm flicks for drops. It was fine. Um, so it became our little our pit stop. And there was a few times that, you know, we just swing in overnight, uh, catch one, move on. Um, then when was the next time I really went and did some on that? Okay, so we we used to go to a show called Deconic. It wasn't a show. It was like a big shop there, bigger shop account. And they'd put on a marquee outside and we'd go over there and set up a stand and whatnot. And I think it was me, Mikey... Chris Eagleston, Blair was there for a bit, but left. And we went, did the show and we went fishing in the evenings. This is when the big dogs thing started. <sighs> Mikey and his big dogs. Like, um, You've got to tell that, mate. I think I must have told it before. Must have told it before. Because it probably was one of these crying stories that I did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we fished a conjunction of canals one night. We all blanked. Yeah, we all blanked. But Mikey had had an occurrence or well, someone had had an occurrence and woke me up at like 1am and I was dying for a piss. We'd had a big barbecue and that. So I get up and I cross it. It's like a big marina sort of thing. And there's like a, a, a concrete track round for cars. It wasn't a road, but it was like a, a road. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It, it was wasn't like, a road, but a road. It was like a road round the, the marina. And I remember like crossing this little road to the bushes to have a piss. And as I'm crossing the road, I could just hear like, should I get the mic yeah, on it? Like on. That's dog's claws. Nice. On the concrete, on the tarmac. I remember turning around and like, imagine it, full moon and these two hounds, like casting these massive long shadows. And I just went, yep, that's me going back to bed. And I just like, dying for a piss, just turned around. What? And these, these fucking dogs were huge. Like one was a German shepherd. One was a, I don't know, a minotaur. It was fucking massive. <laughs> I know, so. but I honestly, it was huge. I don't know what breed it was, but I've got in and like tucked up in bed and I'm in like a little um, scope shelter at that point and this this dog's come past, silhouette of it in front of me. It's turned and it's obviously heard me like rustling in there. It's just staring into what would, from its view, is just this little dark hole. It's just gone, ooh. I could, mate, it was so loud I could feel it echo in my chest yeah <laughs> yeah honestly shitting myself and oh, I just hear Mikey from like 30 yards down there because I was fishing just a little and he's in this little where we had the barbecue there's like three brollies in a little like U shape 
because there was him, Chris Eagleston and Yella. And um, I just hear Mikey go, or Chris go, that sounded like a fucking big dog. And <laughs> I was there going, it is, it is. Um, and I slowly got my rucksack. I had the, I had the plan and I'd, I'd put the rucksack on my bed. If they came at me, it was a case of rolling to the back of the brolly and tipping my bed up. So I had my bed and this rucksack in between me and the bed. And if need be, crawling out the the back of the brolly and running. Nice plan. Yeah, I was like Jason Bourne, mate. Um, <laughs> I was ready. But they, they wandered off down to where they could smell the remains of the barbecue. And um, Mikey was hiding under his quilt. Chris Houston was just sat up and this dog's like, he goes, when it was stood up, it, its head was at the height of my brolly. Nutter. And he was just stood stood there and this dog was like just sniffing him and eating the food. And one was like sniffing Mikey's, where Mikey's head was what, under, the, uh, under the covers. And he was just like, don't move, mate. It's sniffing you. And um, yeah, they end, ended up just going. And then Mikey, we just told us to, I was shitting my pants, but I just told a story that Mikey started crying and the dogs went. <laughs> anyway, so whenever we go to these shows, it's like I say, it's an excuse to go fishing. And especially when like this little special canal is like an hour away. So I'm like, boys, I've got one here. Yeah, I was going to take us down to this canal. So we went to this canal. Um on the second night, we fished that conjunction first night blank. Second night, we fished the canal, nothing. Uh, woke up in the morning, got it. Um, this was probably two years after I'd first fished it. And, you know, I've done a handful of sessions at this point. The one with Carl and the Mus Rat, that was on there. With Lars, me, me and him, like, stopping a couple of times. Um, and we're about to go home. I've wandered down to see Chris and Mikey in the morning going, yeah, we've got to call it. Like, we've got to reel in. We've got to train, like, a cr- crossing to catch. It's about it, got it, like, she's usually good for a wee. And I was just like, that will be my alarm then. Oh, and I've, like, I've got footage of this, so I'll roll it over the top, like, sprinting back up there. I'm in, decent battle, big fish. Um, yeah, and I remember, I remember, like, playing it being so awkward because it's a canal, like, concrete size. Sheer face, yeah. yeah. And they get right under your feet, so the angle on them's like it's almost like boat fishing. You know what I mean? When you're playing them, they're right. It was like right underneath me, but it kept spinning round and like just charging up and down this. And I can see it. And I've got Mikey and um, Chris just going, "Take it easy, Dan. Take it steady. Like it's a big fish." That's like, what you want to hear, isn't it? Brilliant. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Luckily, held good. Went in the net, and it turns out it was the common that mate had caught a couple of years before. Same fish. 38, 39 pounds, something like that. And yeah, mega, absolutely gas. Like we're late now for the tunnel. Um, Who cares? But it's just another, like it's just a little overnight. I've caught that in the middle of this. Yeah, I just love that venue. Um, but I really wanted to catch the big common in there. There was a big common, which was like 45 pound um, and a big mirror. But you know, any of those were like the target. Like I said, it turned into a right little campaign. They were like the targets. Um can't think if we went again. We might have gone again. Again, not caught anything mental, but had a couple. Um, well, but we had, there was a couple of trips. But my next real successful trip was the Deconic show, perhaps the following year. Again, went out with a group of boys. Fished the canal the first night. I had a 30 pounder. They all mugged me off because I let them all choose where they want to go. And then I just went in on the end. <laughs> caught one. They're like, you stitched us up. Um then we fished somewhere else for a couple of nights and that's the time. I don't know if you've heard the story. I'm sure I've, yeah, we've definitely told it on the podcast before where there was like a mobile brothel and yeah. a load of French kids like tried to mug me off in the middle of the night all pissed up and that. That was yours and Tommy's episode, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Season one. Um, so there was the second night and then the, the the boys went home after that. Show was done, but I'd booked some time off work to stay out there. So I ended up doing 10 nights out there. Um, but that again was like that feeling of... Um, adventure because i was on my own then the boys waved goodbye good show got 10 days off now went straight back to that canal so after the first night night i baited it um i don't know a couple of five kilo in maybe over a big stretch though because that's how i fished it like big spread of boilies along the far margin between a big area and just plonk two rods down in the middle and you can maybe move them a bit um i've gone back there and i'm like do you know what i mean like Game um, on. yeah i'm what was that 27 28 i've got days off i'm absolutely out here on my own in a different country and i think in 
that sense of adventure again being in a different country you go in to buy something and you don't speak the language you don't know where you are it's all unfamiliar wrong side of the road and all that and it just makes you feel feel like you're you're out there on your own anyone who's like done those trips even like they're just to belgium a few hours away let alone like driving to like south of france or something Mm. that trip on my own was just so like exciting uh but i had two nights two nights on that canal and i'm rubbing my hands together i've had one a couple nights ago i've baited it now obviously there's no one there because no one fishes it um and i ended up blanking two nights two nights i had three nights on there and i definitely blanked for two nights i sat on the bait and like i'm it's only a thousand meters long and a bit naughty in that but the r3 receivers will reach <laughs> yeah the end of it if i'm fishing middle like do you know what i mean middle of the canal it's a thousand meters long like 500 meters away they will reach so I, i'm looking all the time otherwise i've got to reel in and have to do a lap like so i'd i wouldn't go around to the other side of the canal because that is a long run back to your rod but I'd, I'd walk up make a brew walk up to the end of the canal i'm looking i'm looking i can't find them clarity was terrible we're october at this point as well it's quite late in the year there's a lot of leaf debris on the surface um I come back, I'll stop at my bivvy, I make a brew and I walk the other bit, bit nice and slow, just looking. There's no trees to get up or anything like that. It's just, I just could not find them. You know, it's like seven foot deep at the deepest, yeah. 30 yards wide, 50 fish, something like that. Really? Big ones. Really? That is, it's a lot. I've got done you. it once. Got Damn. You. Got you. Damn. Um, <laughs> but yeah, do you know what I mean? You should find them. Yeah, definitely. They should be, two days just relentless walking back walking forth and so i didn't move because like in my head like they are moving up and down there they just need to cross me and if i if i don't find them i'm not going to move on them and potentially spook it. I, I don't know i just felt i'm just going to stay in the middle until i find them and time's running out for like say last going in so i've done two nights and i'm walking and walking i think no the first thing that second so third morning I've seen one, or what I think was one. I just looked down. Over you? Nah, my, like miles down. Walked down there, had a look, couldn't see anything. Um, sat there for a bit, come back up, made a brew, went back down. And there were, there's loads of like little like crucians. I don't know what carp they are. Yeah, like Carasio things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a little shoulder of them. And they're the first fish I saw in two, two old dot days. So you hadn't even seen them before in those two days? Nah, but I'll tell you what it was. I'd walked down there and as I was sat in there, I was like, water level's dropped and it dropped a foot. It does. It goes up and down with, I guess, balancing the rest of the canals out and it gone down a foot. And so I've gone, I'm going to go make a brew and I'll do a lap because I can see that little bit more now. And yeah, sure enough, got back down to where I'd seen that fish show like an hour or so before and I've seen this little shoal of them. And I was like, okay, that's cool. There's fish here. Walked down a bit further. I remember like watching, watching, watching. And there she was, fucking massive. Big fucking 45 pound, mid 40 common, just gliding through. Right luck, just make it out, but it was Oof. huge. And they're, because it's canal, they're right there. And I've tucked back a little bit and I'm watching it. And um, another one comes through, smaller, and another one comes through. So I'd found like three. And I ended up watching them for like an hour. And They'd always follow that big one, but they were just doing this lap. And I'm right up the other end now, right near the lock. And there's this big bed of um, leaves on the surface from all the leaf fall, all orange leaves. And it's caused this, made this lid and they just disappear under this lid. And I was like, they must all be like hidden under this lid here. Um, but I watched them like, you know, they did the same route every time. They come up the near side. Then they just hit a point, drift down the shelf out of sight, and I'd see them resurface again, just going back up into the leaves. But always that big one was at the front. And so there was a big clear spot, my side, not caused by fish, but maybe caused by fish, but there was a big clear spot of like sat, there was very, a lot of cabbages in that, but there was this big clear spot in between the cabbages, quite high up the shelf, sand. So I've run up there, got my raft. I've watched them a few times. I've gone right, that'll do. They're here. Run up, got my rods, ran down. I've put a little Ronnie rig on this clear spot. Bright pink scope of squid pop up. Bright pink one. I remember because I, I, my thinking was, I don't want to catch either of those 20 pounders behind it. <laughs> like I, I want that one to clock it. 
I don't want them to all start feeding and compete. I just want it to see a bright thing, eat it as yeah. the leader of the pack. Like, so I put that down, handful of flake, sat back, doing my second rod, and I've, like, I'm 20 yards away. It's just looped around, mate. And I was just like sprinting to it, lifted it up. Fucking small one. Fucking small one. So fucking Billy Big Bollocks here. I've got my phone out because obviously I keep in touch with Loz how my trip's going. got my phone out, like, what, did the rod playing? Da, 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 da. So, I, yeah, I'm in. I'm in and I just look down and just see these shoulders just roll. I just went. <laughs> <laughs> I just lobbed my phone behind me like, oh, shit. Like, and it just plodded away then. Like, I don't know what that little tapping was at first, but it just plodded away. Oof, big fish, classic big fish fight. And again, this canal is... You know, they're right there. They're, it's almost like that from the from the off. You ain't hooking them at hundred yards and them like doing a lot like coming back and dogging on the lead. That they're, they're right there. So all that initial fight is under the rod tip from the off. And it's so nervy fishing them on there, <laughs> yeah. fighting them on there. Especially when you've seen it straight away. It's this big common. Um and after I don't know, ten, ten minutes of it dogging up and down, slipping that under it. Um biggest fish I've caught. No, it wasn't biggest fish, but it was you know, it was massive. It was huge. A significant fish as well, that. Yeah. And I was looking to, I knew which one, which <laughs> one it was. It's this big, dirty, great 40 pound common. Um, and I think like the element of being there on your own as well, just like makes it, I just felt like Danny champion of the world. Do you know what I mean? It's like, there's no one there to celebrate with, but I'm just stood there in the water in my knees, just like up to my knees, just thinking like, what am I doing? Firstly, like, I must look all right to that, but also, I don't care. Like, this yeah. is amazing. I've like, battered this I've place. come out, yeah, I've come, yeah, well, I've just come out here on my own. I'm in the middle of a strange country and I've got this dirty, great common in it. Anyway, I've gone, I've taken it out, done my self-takes with it, done a little bit of video. But as I'm doing self-takes, for the first time in years, it's like this couple walked past on this side, not the far side, this side. And he stops and goes, <gasps> Magnifique! <laughs> which I obviously, you know, translates to congratulations on your massive common. <laughs> yeah. Pretty sure. Loosely. Yeah, loosely. Um, so yeah, it was 44 pounds, like 44.4 or something like that. What a fish. Um, it was mega. It was the best fish, probably the best fish I've ever caught just because of the situation and scenario. I remember putting it back and like two girls really fit, <laughs> go, past, <laughs> go past on their... Um, on their bikes and they're looking at me like a weirdo and I'm like, hello, like massive fit. Like, anyway, it was brilliant. Um, and that was it. That, that, that was like my target fish as well. Do you know what I mean? It was like, oh, I've got one of the big ones out of the canal. It wasn't just like tipping up in Belgium and catching one. It was, as you said, it become a bit of a campaign, is not it? Yeah, no, we, we wanted this one or the big mirror like since we started it. Um, I don't know why we named the big mirror the Duke of Belgium. <laughs> Duke of who named that? Lost. No, me and Lost are weird. We got a weird sense of humor. Like <laughs> that I don't is know, um, obscure. We man. never, never, we never caught it. Never caught it. No. Nah. See, we saw it a few times. We've we've been on a few sessions since then. Lost has had a really mega one, like upper upper thirty, uh, like half lin thing, black as your hat, like this long. Wow. Amazing, amazing fish. But um, he went out on a trip on his own as well. But. I think that bit, like, from what I've heard, that big one's potentially got stolen. Has it? Yeah, potentially got stolen. But, um, yeah, I saw it a few times, and, you know, it's £49. Uh, not big Lynn, big, uh, big mirror got stolen, we think. Um, but, yeah, I saw it in the water, like, £49-odd. But, um, yeah, in between all this, waffling on about Belgium, because it's my only kind of interest in fishing. So, <laughs> actually, the second time we went out to... F- um, me, yeah, well, me and Loz. Obviously, I've been out to, with Mike in that with work, but with Loz, the second trip out was to a river, big river. And me and Loz were kind of like kit, taken out there kicking and screaming by yell or who by yell. So, we messaged it. So, the follow the first year, that first year, amazing trip. We found this canal, it's the most beautiful place, favorite venue, like I say, favorite venue. Next year, it was like, right, I know, sort of early in the year, yeah, we're going to plan a trip over when you're free, da da da, mate. He's like, yeah, mate, come and fish the river, because he was fishing the river at the time. I was like, river sounds good, but what about that canal you took us to? That was pretty <laughs> good, too. Um, he was just like, yeah, canal's all right, mate, but come to the river. Um, 
I was like, what do you need for the river? He's like, you need boats, you need batteries. The flow is so savage that you need like some sort of uh, concrete weight and bungee straps to hold your pod in place. Um, it's a bit like urban so it's not like picturesque and that sort of thing. There's barges going by. Is he trying to sell this catfish. to you? Because he's not selling it to me, mate. That's what I mean. And he was like, oh, it's so good. It's all this. And I was just thinking... No, I want this little canal where it's little flicks into the little hard spots. Like this thing's like three meters of concrete wall to the surf uh, to the surface of the water. You know, you're, I was just like, how does anyone fish here? And you've got to climb down ladders into your boat if you've got one. That and sounds fun. Does Spider Man at two in the morning? And I was just like, Lars, how do we tell you we don't want to go here? How do we tell him we just want to go fish under on flicks on this canal and that? He's just like, oh no, maybe we'll go here for a couple of nights or well, no, let's just try it. And I was just thinking, I know Yo yeah, caught big fish out of there, but it's like, what was it? 200 yards wide. Wow. Maybe a bit more. 200 yards wide, 28 miles long or something, 26 miles long, don't know. Yeah, that's a serious river. Yeah, it's not a thousand metres and 30 yards wide, do you know what I mean? Barges and other people. Think, and it was just like, how do you even find them? Like, well, you can see them bouncing like out in the we ain't got echo sounds we ain't got like we're so undergunned he's just like no i'll be fine like come out anyway we went out and i'm so so glad he took us out there because like again it's that going out of your comfort zone that sense of adventure is heightened like i'm spinning around in the boat in a flow which is so fast that if you turn the turn the engine off just for a second and you like you look down and put like you know you've been leading about you're just clipping your rig on you look up and you're 30 yards from where you wanted to drop your rod. <laughs> Not that I really knew where I wanted to drop my rod because it's just five metres deep in concrete everywhere. Like, what's, But we tried to just bait consistently on, and drop it on the same spot, on the same spot, on the same spot. And, um, you know, so those first few trips, it really was a team effort. Loz is on the engine while I'm doing the... So all I can need to concentrate on is getting my rig down, getting some bait around it, then us, then him getting us back upstream to get a good line lay because if you just went directly back rods are hooped like the flow just takes it like more savage than you can ever imagine you're fishing <laughs> you know out there 45 degrees to your to your right and your rod is and your line is pointing 45 degrees to your left and I was like I've just it's like up tiding <laughs> mental fishing and like you know you're locked solid and this is why you need bungees to bungee your pod down and everything and bungee your rod to your pod and then your pod to the floor because just the flow alone was, and it was particularly bad that first session, but with a bit of teamwork, we managed to do it. Um, and again, it was just that sense of adventure, which was just mad. Uh, there was like, I remember like, we'd set the rods and I just remember hearing, bib, I was like, I'm in. Bib, I mean, scrambled down and nothing. And you just hear this tick, <laughs> tick. And it was the clutch. Despite you locking it up, I hadn't just, done it all the way and it was still just taking line tick tick. and you just think how do you even hold bottom so to fish it it's house bricks as a lead on a bit agricultural yeah but i know i know to these european guys like so what did the li- <laughs> it's my french so what did the- <laughs> it's a little house brick there's nothing like it's you know second nature to them they don't really care but like for us putting like dropping a rig with a house brick on it that's well out of my comfort zone it mate. was mad eight ounce back leads half like double eight ounce back lead. so one not far from the lead and then one sort of two thirds of the way back across so at least you can get kind of an half decent line there most of the time when that fish picks up the line because the flow then back leads come up and you just go like you know it just hacks back round in the flow um but anyway also where we fished there was like this little cut off out the river which turned into this lovely little slack of nature reserve kind of almost like an abandoned marina almost off the river it's two foot deep and it comes up off the shelf of the room it's two foot deep and we ended up catching them out of there as well because they, they use it in and out but um yeah to make a long story short um we caught a couple mid twenties out the fly, which is what we really wanted when we were there. We're like, how sick would it be to be boat battle midnight? <laughs> and it was, that's what we got. Like, yeah, Loz got a bite. He shouted me for help and he was going out in the boat. So I've jumped in the boat with him. We've jumped, we're out in the middle of this river and we're playing. He's just in the dark and it's so quiet. It's so quiet. Despite being quite urban, it's two o'clock in the morning and it's lit by the street lights and there's a house around. 
huge river. You're just in the middle of that river. You could be a million miles from anywhere. And all you can hear is the tick of the clutch and the duk, 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 from the, from the engine. It's just so quiet. And he's just playing this fish, playing this fish. And obviously with the flow, we're just going, and I can just see my little white van getting further and further away. <laughs> Finally, he's got it up, landed it, 26 pounder. Beautiful. Um, was that mine? That might've been my fish. That might, I think that was my fish actually. Um, Anyway, we're going back and it's like, come on, dig, 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 and we're buzzing. You know, we're chatting to each other. Oh, did you see this? Did you see that? That's amazing. <laughs> da, 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 da. You know, we've got the fish in the net next to the boat. Loz is on. Da, 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 da. And I've looked up. I've got no closer to that white van. No closer. I was just like, fuck, turn around. There's this shipping barge like a few hundred yards away. So we've got to like come off to the side and it's like, it wouldn't have seen us. We've got no lights on this tiny down. little. Yeah. And it's just got this massive like headlamp thing and that goes chugs past and we're at this point we're like we're still trying to get upstream anyway we've floored it put it full and yeah eventually we've got closer and closer to this van as we get close to the van we're chatting away we're still buzzing and you just hear (laughs) and i was just like schloss i could just hear this alarm i was like oh god and um yeah we come around the corner to where like our rods were on this little concrete deck and the other set of rods that were in the shallows and with, you know, we like that with our head torches on like, can you see the rod? I can't hear the alarm anymore. What's happening? And I just see this rod pod on the side. And I was like, <laughs> Oh God. And even though That'll we, buck- you know, buckled it all down, rod pods on the side. And there's only one rod in sight. I was like, go, 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 go. Like, trying to usher the, the the boat quicker and quicker. And like, as soon as we've got close enough, Loz just like leapt out. He'd run that. And yeah, the rod had been pulled down the bank a little bit. But I think the bungee cord was still attached to the pod. So it hadn't like gone in. Um, <laughs> and yeah, he had a, like a mid 20 as well. So we had this mega brace shot. Um, and it's just so like, that's cool. You know, it was just, that's what it was. It wasn't like sitting on this like little lake near St. Ives or just in the, in the, Fens, it was you know it was proper it was mental it was so outside of anything that we'll ever experience in england um and what a result what a result yeah so again i've got loads of tales of when we've been out there i've caught a couple of really nice fish the following morning or the last no the last night about 3 a.m um i had a real good and 43 43 pounder out the river mint just on for ages and ages and ages just trying to get like I played this one from the bank because we caught it just on the shelf as it come up into this into the shallow just so as it you know the bottom of the shelf like four meters I played it for ages and ages and I knew it was a good I knew it was good and yeah had this mega one and you know did the photos in the sun with the barges going past the next um the next morning I might have footage of that as well which I'll show um but yeah it was wicked it was just cool a, a 40 pound river carp mate in yeah. that sort of setting as well as exactly some like, and, and you know when you go to these trips and it's like your one trip of the year to do something like that we, we always say you go out there one fish each buzzing you know you get one fish each happy but like to have something like that sick um but that was nothing that was nothing compared to what happened that evening so it's our yeah we're going to, it's our last 24 hours now i've done my photos of my one amazing wicked um that's nothing compared to what yeah happened. So we're having a barbecue in the evening with Yell because every night this is where Golden Yell is. Yell puts us on the spot. I baited it a bit or whatever, or um, I've had you know I've done well in this uh, this area in the past or in this time of the year in the past. Have a go, boys. And then he'll just fuck it. He will leave us to it. He won't fish because he, he wouldn't want to put too many lines in the water to cut us off or anything like that. Because especially when you're fishing a canal or river. If you have lines at either end, it can cut you off and all that. And he's... What a boy. He's a boy, mate. And so he'll just sit with us all day and he'd go, right, I'll just go put my rods out. I was like, how do you just go on your own, put your rods out in a swim somewhere? like? And so he was with us all day. We had a barbecue and that. And, you know, sun just starts to get low. And he goes, right, I'm going to head up there. I had nothing down that way. I'm going to go. And he went about a mile upstream. Upstream, downstream. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making it up anyway. Yeah. No, I'm joking. Um, he, yeah, so he went like a mile upstream uh, to do his night uh, with another guy that we met called Franz. And uh, yeah, me and Loz are all content. Look at us, the boys. We've come out here and we've uh, 
you've had a couple of fish each, 40 pounders. And smashed what, it. Yeah, smashed it. I've got a call from Yale. Well, Loz got the call. And I remember him just like looking at me going, yeah, 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 I'll send him up. Yeah, I'll send him up. Okay. And he just looked at me and went, oh, he's got one of the big ones. And so there is known fish on the stretch. And so if someone calls you to say he's got one of the big ones, it's a big one. So I've grabbed my camera stuff. I've, I've driven up there. Obviously, Loz was so gutted he, he couldn't come because he had to stay with our stuff. Um, it's not something you can just quickly pack up and put in the van. Anyway, I've tanked up there. It's a mile or so, but on this dirt track. And I've got up there and yeah, we caught the best fish I've ever seen in my life. The best fish you've ever seen in your life? Nah, that's me just been spinning the tail. But it was fucking incredible. Like, to catch it out of that environment, but for it to be that big as well, was mental. So he'd caught one, I can't remember what they call it, or where there was some confusion whether it was actually that fish or not, because it was quite a big plane thing. But it was 27 and a half kilos, oh. which is a touch over 60 pounds out of a public bit of river that anyone can fish on a 35 euro license. That's madness. And he'd just gone out. He'd found on the Echo this nice little shelf and he'd just dropped the bait on it. He'd never fished it before or anything like that. Or he'd, he'd, I mean, he may have fished it before, but it's not like it was pre bet He just he just done it because we were nearby. And this is the ultimate test of karma. Like he sorted us right out. He's just gone, flicked his rod out, handful of boilie, come back in, rod's gone. And yeah, 61, 62 pounds. 60 pound river Mate, car. The thing was like a fucking cow. Like I've <laughs> never seen anything that big. It's I think it's, it must be, it must be the biggest fish I've seen on the bank even to this day. And like its head was like, and it, I remember I had eyes like golf balls. Like, I've got photos, but Yell's not a big bloke in stature anyway. So but him looks. Just, like he tanked the photos, mate. He put it up and he did not put it down till I was like, yeah, sweet, I've got them. Like, and he was just there with this huge thing. And like, it's the head on shots where you can see him, like how big it is against him, a full grown man. And I was just blown away. It was that unreal, is the fish mate. of a lifetime, Honestly. Mate, and that's, so we weren't really bang on the river when we first was said like well, I was like this sounds a bit shit Lars, to be honest let's go back to that. but after that after seeing that and having even one that I had we went back for a couple of years and we always had success like I had another 43 pound or something like that at the river so it was just like and again bouncing between that and the canal like Belgium's just been so good and there's so many more stories which like oh some I can't even tell because it gives away where we were too much but yeah it's just sick like it's just so good. It sounds like real, like, as you say, you can tell how much you love it, but also mm. it just sounds like carp behave like carp. And also, yeah, you've got so much peace and tranquility with it. Yeah, that's it. And like, you remember I was saying, like, you're not exactly going to see him bouncing. I remember, like, not that trip, but subsequent trips, we've just been sat there, like, brew on late at night or early, early in the morning, and just in the street lights on the other side, <laughs> And like they just turn up on you, mate, and they're just and they're just bouncing, and you're just like, how? Like in this environment, like how, or, or a big catfish goes over, and the big tail comes out. And there's cats in there too, big ones. Yeah, I think I had one which was as big as the boat. <laughs> Gonna need a bigger boat. Like it, this one was quite funny. We we're a bit pit. This another story. Waffle. I, was, I remember saying like I've got nothing to talk about, but it's loads. Uh, loads of waffling. Um, yeah, one of the trips, midday, shit, it's time of the day to catch one. Real hot, 30 degrees. I always get sunburned to fuck when I go out there. Um, and I've had a run and I'd foul hooked a catfish. <laughs> I think I'd hooked it, but I think at some point I'd lost it or the hook had come out and it's boom, caught in the tail or the side. But anyway, try getting a... It no, stop it. Can't have been far off 100 pounds, 70 pounds, 80 pounds, something like that. It was huge. It was like, we had a 3.2 meter boat and it was the length, like literally, not the length of the boat, but like the length of the inside. It wasn't a three and a half meter catfish, do you know what I mean? But it was like, it fit in the boat, just like the- end to end. And I was just like, this. but anyway, I'm playing it and I'm a bit pissed anyway because we've been <laughs> sinking beers and having barbecue and that. Um, and I'm playing it and my... The, at the point I knew it was foul looked, I was just giving it everything. And I've got uh, pursuits at the time. It was just hooped, like right hooped over. And I was just like, Ugh! probably a bit, bit of Dutch courage is that as well. <laughs> and like twice we had to mid fight, 
because I just couldn't get it up. Looking left and right all the time for the barges. Twice we had to go back to the bank, rod tip, you know, right up to the rear underwater as a barge came by. Oh, wow. And, and then go back out. Yeah, it was sweet. And I had it on for like 45 minutes. But yeah, there's a couple of dirty, great stinking catfish in there. Like, In terms of sort of other trips or any notable trips, have you taken anybody else out there from the Nash team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Mikey. Mikey. So Mikey, yeah. like, came with... Because I'd been there first and I always... When I started in Nash, I told him about our trips to Belgium and I always say to everyone, like, this is the best canal. I'll have to take you there. Um, but also, yo, there's also certain... I remember fucking up after my f- I took Carl there and I didn't tell yo. It was a bit of naivety in terms of like you, you got to show a bit of respect and I think it's it's heightened a little bit in Belgium I just just too naive to the fact that like oh we've shown us this spot I don't have to keep it quiet but it's like nah Dan I've shown you somewhere keep it quiet like or don't and I don't blow it yet. yeah and I put a couple of pictures up and I'd like and I was just none the wiser and I apologised took the pictures down and whatnot it was fine like, obviously but so every time I took someone you got to look, I said to you I was like most of the time we met you anyway but yeah so Mikey Chris Eagleston Alfie, Max, Tommy came on that second trip when I stayed out there. Or one of the trips when I stayed out there. Um, who else? Curly's uh, been out there with you, has he? No, this is a different trip. So this is funny, actually. There's not loads not loads happened there. But so one year, I didn't go out with Lars. I went out with Curly and Puke. And I knew Puke. Puke's a weird one. If you don't know, Puke is Luke Bounds. If you don't know him, yeah. his name is Cotswold. <laughs> Puke, puke on Instagram. Uh, I didn't like, I knew friends of friends and that sort of thing, but he's just one of those guys who don't really give a fuck about anything. <laughs> he just started messaging me one like, I think I met him at Carp Camp once or I met him at Bramble Mere when we'd been, but never like hit it off. Like he's a sound guy, like he was a sound guy, but never like mates, mates, but he just added me and then he just start texting me or like, he's just a punisher basically. <laughs> and just, but like a good time, like not just a punisher, but he was just like, he just start ripping the piss out of me on Facebook. Like, Who's this <laughs> that's a bleep <laughs> that is a bleep sorry people <sighs> so I'm like who is this guy and he just rinsed me but I, I quite like that like yeah we shared the same weird sense of humour yeah he's funny and, yeah um, anyway like we'd been on a like a session fishing and got to know each other quite a bit and he said oh we'll go Belgium I've got a place like we've been showing a place you come out sweet and then, this was like the week before I was like when next week yeah sweet five days Done in the diary. We went, met Curly. And it's like, again, that was like one of the first times I met Curly. We went out to this series of lakes, and there's like probably nine lakes, five of them and four of them, all attached by like underwater tunnels or channels. Um, this is in Belgium. In Belgium, yeah. Um, so they're five lakes, and they are separate lakes, and they've all got different names, but they are attached by either a little channel or an underwater tunnel which you can't even see but under one of the paths there's a tunnel and the carp can move from lake one to lake five and you know ne- like if no one told you you wouldn't really know because some of these channels you can't even tell it's like a reed line but at the end of the reed line the island ends and there's a little channel where they can get through and you think they ain't going through they ain't going through a tunnel but like long story short one of the fish i caught on the first day someone caught it on the last day from like three lakes down <laughs> Like head fuck sort of place, yeah, but traveller absolute playground, mate. Like um, we'd met Gaz out there as well. It's one of the first time I met Gaz, and he's been fishing it for a, for a few years. And it's just there's some mega fish in there. It's an absolute playground. You'd like stalking them out the edge on one lake one day, and you might try and get them going on floaters the next day, and then you're fishing a spot in a different lake another day for the same fish. And then you might move over to the next complex complex of lakes and you find them and you know like we caught them all sorts of taxes but you know puke had one 33 34 pound on a bread bomb um it was just amazing every day i packed up and we're on the barriers and we're walking around and having a great social but there was a couple of funny things that happened so we were dead tired um pretty much like as you do we sat up late watching like on those photography or youtube or something and um we had like an hour sleep drove out there got there, walked around all day, decided on swims. We all split up. We actually all fished different lakes, but kind of near each other. I fished one lake and all night I'm 
catching tension carp. Like I had three on my first night and a handful of tench and you know, I'm running on empty, but before I know that like, I've got half hours kit, sun's coming up, boom, rods away again, add another one, done the photos. It's like, right, I'm shattered, but I could have stayed there and I think and reap my rewards for the next five days. But you know, with this complex, I was like, nah, I'm not here to sit and just I sounds weird. Yeah. I want to explore. I want to have a good, good time and a bit of a social. So, um, Pew could already rang me that morning because I've got one. It's snagged up. Can you come help me? So I was like, yes, yeah, sweet. Ra- uh, this is before they'd done the photos of mine. So I've gone around to his and he was just like, I'm going to go out. Like it's gone around the corner. I'm going to go out on this unhooking mat in my waders. And I was like, do that. You will die. Do not do that. You're in a dick. And he even got on his unhooking mat at one point, <laughs> got in the water. I was like, Pew, what are you doing, mate? Like, honestly, it's not worth it. It's probably 20 pound carp. Like, swim out sure don't go in waders riding your unhooking mat he got in and the, he just started like sinking slowly he went yeah that's not a good idea <laughs> just got back out but he not, got out yeah you're not allowed boats on there but we had a little inflatable in the motor and i thought or well, we both thought i'd rather go out and try and unsnag this carp than it just be tethered call it illegal or whatever but for me that's bad angling leaving that there so i ran and got the boat Pumped it up. He went out. Uh, carp are gone. Gutted. Didn't have to get the boat in the end. Um, anyway, so he's lost. He's lost his. He's had us. Basically, this is the story of Puke's mare of, for the week. Next day, um, I'll fish somewhere else. Curly's fish somewhere else. Puke's fish somewhere else. He's found some like on Lake One. I'm one side of Lake Two. Um, just for. Um, so you can kind of gauge where we were. He's on one lake. I'm on the like the next lake. Um, and I've woke up in the morning and I've just heard two, an alarm going 700 yards away. And I'm going, you know, when you can just hear a ringing sometimes when you're fishing, it's like a factory or something. I'm going, is that an alarm? Is it not an alarm? <laughs> Sounds like an alarm. I've rang Curly going, can you hear that? And he's just waking up going, yeah, I can. Sounds like an alarm. I was like, Rang puke, nothing. Rang puke, nothing. Honestly, it was going for so long. Nothing, nothing. I was like, what is wrong? Like, is he all right or what? Is he okay? Anyway, alarm stopped. And finally, after like fifth call, or he might rang me back. Because so I was about to reel in and go round. He's rang me like, what? What do you want? I was like, have you had a run? He's like, no. I was like, are you sure? And he's just like, he, I'll get onto it, but he had lost one, but he goes, apart from telling me that, it's like, no, I can see my rods from it. I'll call you back. He'd been fishing. No, you know, he's fishing bed chair, rods are 10 yards and he fished one there and one there, 10 yards away. How's he missed that? In the edge. I think it must've been from staying up all night, going out there, hot. It was July. It was real hot. Not really getting much sleep, staying up all day, walking. He must've just been done. And also I've walked into the, sw- so I've got, I'm going to come see you. Um, and I walk around, his face is just littered with mosquito bites. He's all swollen and that. <laughs> and he's just holding this light, like, he's fishing the edge. It's just pinged straight to the middle to this weed bed. And he's just like, can you get the boat again? <laughs> so he just slept through this run. Literally like cast away. I'd heard this run seven, it, it probably woke me up 700 yards away. He was 10 yards away, just dead out. Nothing. Um, anyway, boat. Um, out there, pick the weed, pick the weed, pick the weed. Up comes this mid thirty uh, mirror, sees it, shakes, lost it, gutted. Gets back to the bank, tells me I also lost a fish on my other rod. I was like, "Are you okay?" So on the other rod, this is f- like such a freak accident. So his lines like he's using a sawn off, and he was using these little Daiwa reels, and so where the bow arm is, the little roller there was like a little chink out of the plastic in the roller or the metal in the roller, like a little groove. And as the fish had like taken the line out of the clip and started taking line, it, the line had like jolted out of the roller and into this little groove. groove. It's like someone had like cut it with a Stanley. So there was just this little groove in the, and it just gone in there, tink snapped. And so there was just this much line hanging off the end of the reel, like a couple of inches, sorry, if you, not watching it, a couple of inches of line just hanging off it from the roller. Oh, that's the saddest thing I've ever seen. And so he just picked this rod up in the morning and was just like, 
and it was just stuck in this, <sighs> stuck in this little thing. He's had a mare. It like, again, love it. Long story short, he'd, um, we went on to have a few fish each. He, he ended up redeeming himself, catching a, a few. Like, I think he ended up catching more than me. Like, um, well, at least he had some, because that is a nightmare. He had a nightmare trip, but it's again, it's just that adventure and that of just going out to the set of lakes, just absolute pro- playground, just fishing different areas and just bowling around, having a good time. It was good. Like, and I get so many messages about Belgium and about like, where'd you fish and how do you go out there? And all I ever say to people is, and if you listen and want to do it, Honestly, a lot of the spots, as I said, I've been told. I can't really tell people, especially just not any random people. But the um, the quality of fishing out there in any stretch of water, if you've got a bit of time to play with, you can go out there for a week, you're laughing. Like, just drive. You see a canal, stop, have a walk, see anything, fish it. Or put a bit of bait in, come back the next night. Like, just stop at every bit of water and whatnot and just... As long as you've got that ticket, that golden ticket to Belgium, you're laughing. And realistically, mate, it's not far, is it? Oh, if you mate. live down here, you're probably quicker sometimes getting the tunnel, obviously in non-COVID times, getting the tunnel across and getting to Belgium yeah, than you are going, I don't know, across to around the M25. Yeah, there's many times on a Friday, we clocked off like an hour early, left at four, and we've had rods out by nine, rods out by nine o'clock, not even like at the spot, like, Two hours to the tunnel, half from down here, like I say, two hours to the tunnel, max. Half hour over the tunnel, hour, well, like 45 minutes, hour, you're into Belgium. And then so however, however far your spot is, laughing. Like, it's easy. I've, it's taken me longer sometimes to get to like Northern Angling Show or to Chernpool or sort of like from to the Cotswolds from down here. Like, let's go Belgium, mate. Sick. Sorry, Belgium anglers. I'm sending England Flooded. your way. Yes, it's just amazing. And it's it's been, by far, it's been some of my best fishing and most memorable stories. Like, I've just waffled for God knows how long. I'm so no, sorry. No, you definitely wetted my appetite to go back to Belgium. But like, there's so many of those scenarios and every trip has something funny happen. Like, I've been out with Jordan Dix before and we'd caught nothing. Me, Loz and Jordan. But like, so many funny stories off the back of it. and That's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, memories and, yeah, and experiences. What about memorable filming shoots etc during your time at Nash anything significant really stand out yeah so despite me talking loads about fishing I don't go all that much and the amount of times I've filmed and been on filming trips has far outweighed the nights I've done on the bank fishing um filming it's good isn't it it's good like I don't it. do much of it mate I it's don't fun. know it's a good job um what was the question again? What, what well, you're, you're sort of memorable. memorable filming rather than fishing. You're memorable sort of filming mm. exploits in Nash times. You've had uh, a lot, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I've, I've been on loads of shoots, loads of shoots. Um, obviously, like memorable ones, Social 2, I really enjoyed. Went to Austria. Um, it was kind of me and Carl. We all film it, do you know what I mean? We all film it, but like me and Carl would like meet up every morning and we'd film it. Like we'd be the one I flip rods out at night, but it wasn't really about for us fishing. It was, I know other companies, it's like videographers strictly no fishing, but this was the social and like the actual story is the fact that it is a social and we're all a team here and we all go fishing, but videographers, you've got to film it. <laughs> so like, although yeah, I'm, I can do a bit of fishing. I don't film very good if I'm fishing. So we didn't feel me and Carl didn't fish much. And it just, it was one of them, which all just come together. Nice. Like we had this storyline of, wanted to go out there and catch one of the big ones out of Harry's legs after he came over. And it was just one of those things where everything fell into place. There was highs, there was lows, there was heartache, there was elev- um, elation at the end. And Blair caught one of the biggest, no, that is the biggest fish I've yeah, seen. That's, some, that's yeah. the bigger one that I've yeah. seen. Than, yeah. So yeah, the, uh, uh, Blair caught that one, 68, 69 pound. And it's one of them, like it, I'd soppy again, but whenever I do any of these socials, we've got one coming out in May. Like we did on Bluebell, we've done the Poland one. Like we've got another mega one coming up at the end of the year. Don't tell anyone. Um, we got like there's such like it's such a good team bonding experience, and it gives you such a appreciation for all the boys that you work with, and the you know the fact that that is your job. Like it's so good, and that one was just particularly one where we were like, yeah, this is sick. We really really enjoyed it. Um, the others, yeah. What else was that like? I guess one of the most more interesting shoots I've done, 
the urban bank shoot's always good, but that underwater one in particular was mental. Yeah, you enjoyed that that aspect. Yeah, because it was a bit more than like turn up, film man wrapping up, film man catching fish, film ending. Like, do you know what I mean? Like one of them bog standard shoots. It was like there was a lot more thought and that behind it, which was pretty much just done by Alan, me, the divers talking to Mark Vusen. Loads of people then in the end, but <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. no, it was one of them, which is like, it wasn't some massive production scale or massive. Like it was just, we went there with some cameras and a couple of divers. And like the plan was to just go out in the morning, put some cameras down. We've got two days to try and catch a carp in front of cameras. Why? Because that's what you'd do. If I saw loads of people going, Corders is loads better. Stop trying to be Corder. And it was like, Corders is loads better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Garen, yeah. but we're not, we weren't trying to do it. Like, you know, we weren't trying to like, what do they call it? Um, something theatre. You know, it, it, we were. Theatre. Yeah, some TV term, I think. But um, we weren't trying to do like a study. What works? What doesn't? Why doesn't this work? Why don't they? Why don't a campaign? But we were just two really keen anglers. Like, what if we dive down and put a rig down? What would happen? Like, we just did it. It's like what, what we said. It's like if you had a camera or anyone had a camera, what you do with your mates if you could put it down there? And that's what we did. And um, yeah, it was just a mad shoot. Turned out really well. We had Vusen over to help us. He's always a pleasure to have on on set. The divers were sound. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah different. it just went well. But like the funny bit was we've been watching, I don't know if it's ever come across in the film, we were watching the cameras all day and like finally the screens had started running out of battery. The cameras hadn't, they'll run for ages, but the screens had. So you're, we're watching it live. And so towards the end of the day, like I think we put it in and we'd had a carp in front of the camera, like honestly, first like 12 minutes, there's carp troughing. Result. We're, like, we're going to get one, we're going to get one. We, he, they just got mugged off basically. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Saws, Alan. I'm sorry, Alan. Um, and then the Bree moved in for like, you know, that's that morning spell. We got them in first light, morning spell done. Bree moved in for the day and we're just watching cameras like flicking from one camera to the next. Like, this ain't going to happen. This ain't going to happen. It was weird. Like, especially when you speed the footage up at the end, you see the light levels change like that. And then bam, carps in, carps in, carps in. Like it was honestly, it was on that light levels changing. Carps started turning up. And, but I remember like saving the batteries, saving the batteries and turning the screens off, turning the screens off. And, um, I remember just sitting there going, oh, I'll just check the camera. We've got 15 minutes of light left. Honestly, it's getting dark. So I just check the camera. And as I've turned it on, there's just this silhouette of a fish just. <laughs> oh, no checking. way. And I've just gone, you're in. Like no bleeps on the rod yet. Um, Cause it's literally just picked the bait up and boom, 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 boom. Like, and I think as Alan starts running, bib, 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 bib. And he's hit it. And obviously it happened, but it was just like that. I'd clicked that camera on so many times, nothing there. And I just clicked on and just went, oh, you're in. <laughs> like that was one, which was, I think it was just the buzz of it, which was made it such a good shoot is the fact that like odds were against us. Alan's been in a diving suit to try and like, and then you want carp to come and feed on a spot. And you know, we'd seen them and then they, and yeah. So the fact that it actually, like we'd actually done it. The, the stupid plan where we'd never practiced. Yeah, no we'd prep. Never, we'd never put cameras down there. We'd never practice it. We just turned up on the day and went, let's give this a go. Alan had practiced diving and he had to practice diving the lake, but not with cameras. I didn't know how the cameras worked or if there's going to be any technical <laughs> issues or how we're going. Do you know what I mean? Like, Classic. We just did it. Yeah, and, and it worked. And Jesus Christ, it fucking worked. Like we actually caught one and that was the, that was the buzz of it. You know, like in terms of a video, like... Yeah, a lot of people, quite a few people quite negative about it. But like, it was like, just again, that experience of it was just like, it's a big buzz, mate. It's good. Yeah. It's good. I think that's like quite a good way to sort of summarise just the team in general is like, it is a family, but there's always a buzz around like everything that is done in terms of it is passion, it is drive. There's a lot of like off the cuff ideas and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of where we are now, um, there's a lot of characters in the team is what I would say. I, you can take that. How you want to take that mm. for you. I've is, got one more story. Okay. Yeah. I've just thought, I, I just thought if you start talking to me, I, I'll have a few stories prepared, but this one's the one that I forgot. 
What is it? And I wasn't going to tell it, but I am going to. What is it? Can you remember the live stream? Which uh, live no, stream? Not the live stream. Christmas podcast. Christmas podcast? Yes. Mikey told a story about me putting a maga on my bum. Which, while I'm here, I'd like to put on record is true. No, I'm joking. It's not true. <laughs> I did not put a live animal up my bum. I actually said to you, like, is that a bit much? I For, can't look yeah, at you right honestly, now. <laughs> honestly, I said to you, didn't I? I was just like, you, you know, as a professional brand, Nash Tackle, big brand in the industry, can we really, on our podcast, talk about a story where a, a, a man puts an animal, a live maggot, up his bum? I couldn't believe I was having that conversation, but I was like, do you know what? Fuck it. I don't really care. If, if Mikey wants to say it, Mikey wants to say it. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. The story's not true. I did that. Mikey didn't neck half. If if he necked half a, what was it, gallon of citrus, he'd yeah, probably citrus die. Syrup. I didn't put a maggot on my bum. I don't know. We. I don't know what I'm talking about. Denying this. it like over and over again is always but a good the way. The story I'm about to tell is true, and I swear on my mother's life this happened. Talking about funny shoots or things that happen on filming shoots, we went out to France, and it was in the midst of Colin and Alex had left. I, had Lou Porter left? I think Lou Porter left. I was pretty much felt like I was out on my own. And I Solo was, warrior. On that, what, on that shoot, I was. It was just me, and I'm filming three anglers on an exclusive lake where it's one lake, but it was it's two lakes. Like It's two lakes, and they're connected by a channel around the back. Yeah, the video's come and, out, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah family yeah. fish. Um, not family, like a French fishing holiday video. So it was three lads going to fish, uh, a, a French holiday, but... A, it was 40 degrees. Some days it was 40 degrees. Um, average was like 35, 36, 37 degrees. So that is tough temperatures to fish in, let alone like filming, especially when I'm filming Mikey um, on one lake, setting up, getting doing that sequence and then like running over and doing Tommy and then running like I was shattered. Like I was just constant from 5 a.m. till 10 p.m. Like just filming the boys out on my own. Where's that little violin, Dan? Beep, 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 beep. Um, anyway, like... Picture it, it's second day. I can't believe he's going to be so annoyed. Um, second day, third day, something like that. 10 a.m., 10, 11 a.m. in the morning. Um, uh, So heat of the day, think think of this, heat of the day. And think about how hot it is inside a bivy as well. And Not that, nice. Yeah, so we were lucky there's a lodge and we were just sat under the, in the shade of the lodge. And anyway, I was like, right, maybe just had a bit of breakfast or a brew or whatever. Like I was like, right, I need to go do a bit, a bit with Mikey. Let's just see how he's been getting on. Just update, um, update the viewers on what, how he's been getting on. Walking over a tripod and camera to his bivy. And he's got his like mesh panels in the back. So you can see in and out, but you, like you can't really see in, but you can see out. Joke. Like I've walked around the front of his bivy. Jokingly, I've gone. I must've said something like, are you wanking? And I've, as I've come round, there's Mikey with, no. with, with his shorts just tucked down a little bit. Well, no, at first he just went, no, no, wait, no. He said, yes. He goes, yes. And I, and you're I, joking. And I thought he was joking. So I laughed and then I just was like, oh my God, he was. And I could just see that his pants, his like shorts were down a little bit. His hand was down his trousers and he was just like, fuck off. <laughs> Middle of the day in a bivy. Just think of the hot, sultry, hot, sweaty, and he was just there. And he, but the thing is, he was like, "You're not going to be able to hear me very well because I'm t- turning." He was like looking out as I came round. Said, "Are you wanking?" He was looking out the back of the the yeah the, the vent. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, "How did he not see me coming?" Unless he'd I saw him coming. Uh, <laughs> you didn't, mate. <laughs> Unless he'd seen me. Like I don't know. He must have not been looking, concentrating on something else. And then when he's looked like that, I've come round. Um, and he was just like, fuck off. And I was just, no, ran off like, I found him. I've got him wanking. Mikey's wanking. I just ran, I just ran off just announcing it to, well, it was only me, Mikey. It's plume I juice, Dan. It's <laughs> plume juice. <laughs> Honestly, it was the funniest thing. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like 10 a.m., like 11 a.m. in the morning. Like, if you're going to do it, do it at night. <sighs> you know That's I mean? workout Wednesday stuff. Ah, uh, mate, it was so funny. Like, but, Good as gold though, Mikey. Like, no shame. Just like, yeah, what? I'm a man and I've got needs. He wasn't embarrassed by it. He's still not. This, like, I did say to him, like, do you mind if I tell this story? What did he say? And he went, oh, don't tell it. But then I thought, oh, fuck him. 
<laughs> no, Mikey, I, I had nothing to do with it, Mikey. I love you, he's mate. Ma- he's made up this horrible story about me putting a mag up my bum. So I'm not getting involved in yeah. these turf wars, man. I'm just a facilitator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then I am. deserve that for the Mikey f- stories, like the crying stories, which, yes, fair enough, they are not true. Don't ruin magic. <laughs> I ain't got any more in the locker. I've done so many, I can't think. So do you know where they started? <laughs> no, go on. While I'm on the stitch up. Um, so the first one's in Life at Nash 2. We did a interview with Loz when he left. I've just watched it back today. Audio is awful, but YOLO. Um, yeah, so Loz did an interview about him leaving and he, someone said the funniest moment at Nash and his was like Mikey in Teliats with his boat floundering around on Kev's spot because he doesn't know how to and then he was really embarrassed and so, and t- Loz tells it so good and like went into his bivvy afterwards and he was just there and he was just crying and that's where like I was just in bits listening to that and editing that video and so that's where it started <laughs> you've taken it to a different that's where it level. started but there, do you know what there's another one which just kills me like I remember this is how weird Loz is as well so we're just going to Asda one day uh, there's an Asda up the road so we're like going out for lunch uh, just grab a bit of lunch for, from from Mazda, and we're in the van, and we're driving along, and out of nowhere, Loz just goes, "You ever heard about the Daryl Peck and Mikey beef?" And I was like, "What? Yeah, Mikey don't like Daryl Peck, mate." And I was like, "Okay, go on, juicy, do you know, what? industry goss." Yeah. And I've actually told this story before in one of the other podcasts, um, but put a different spin on it. Um, I was too scared to say any names. <laughs> All but, right. Um, so my, uh, then Loz has proceeded to tell me this, spin me this story about how Daryl Peck wanted to, um, he went into Anglin Direct to get an order and the order was wrong and they're trying to find out who did it. And he was like, the little maggot boy with the shit hair, the little maggot boy with the shit <laughs> earrings and the shit hair. And they were like, we don't know who it is. And then he saw him and went, him, that's him. And Mikey started crying. And then like, since then he doesn't like Daryl Peck. So I was just like, fuck, really? That, that's mental. Bit harsh or pecky, like. But he was only a kid at the time. And so it must have been like, and Loz has just told me it, dead serious. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he's just brought out of nowhere. It's like, oh, you ever heard of it? Like, do you know what I mean? I had no reason to believe it wasn't true. He just told me, mate to mate. Like, two, three weeks later, I must have been in Mikey's office. Loz working away there, and Mikey, oh, yeah, so... I, I didn't realise you didn't like Daryl Pett. You don't know, like, you've got a bit of beef. He's like, what are you on about? I was like, you know, from when you were a kid and he called you out, he said you got shit hair and shit earrings <laughs> and that. You know, the little maggot boy. And he was like, what are you? I've turned around, I've clocked Loz and Loz is just like red face in bits, just pissing. <laughs> it's to- a belter, Loz, like, Loz can't even remember telling me that story. He's just done it. He's just planted a seed and then he was there to see it grow. What and, a legend. Like, Bring back Loz. Oh. So disclaimer, that story is not true. Daryl Peck did not go into Anglin Direct and say Mikey's got shit air and all this. There's no beef between <laughs> there might be now, but <laughs> no. uh, so like that's where it started. Loz just making up these stupid fucking stories and I just ran with it a little bit. While you're on the stitch it, mate, a stupid story that I've been it's been teased to me oh, but never mate. told the details is the infamous, the enigma that is Henry Lennon right, yeah. and the sticky baits, lads. Yeah, so this is funny. I lo- I don't know how anyone likes me here because I'm the, as you've seen, <laughs> am I not the biggest wind up in the office? Yeah, but like, you're funny. You're funny. But I'm a knobhead. <laughs> like how anyone doesn't like me, like I guarantee they're down there going, fuck's sake, I can't, like went Dan be out of that podcast in a minute and fucking, he thinks he's funny but he's really not like, but it's funny. You are funny, man. I think most like, people would say you're the funniest. I think I know a line when, like, if someone d- doesn't react well or is just like, fuck off, Dan, like, I'd be like, oh, okay, too far. Do you know what I mean? But um, until then, until then, I'll go hell for leather on them. And my favorite target, as you've seen twice or three times today, Henry, I get bites out of. So, but Henry, I love because I think he's he's got a good sense of humor. Like, we, we bounce with each other very well. Uh, we have a right good crack and um, he's not afraid to give it as much as he gets it as well. Like he slates me, but he has a, as you've heard in his podcasts, he has a, a record of horrendously embarrassing stories or <laughs> yeah. just getting themselves in these stupid situation. It used to be that is so Max Hendry. It's now that is so Henry Lennon. And he came back from a fishing session and he was like, I've done it again. And 
this is brilliant. He let me tell you, he let me tell you this anyway. So he's turned up on a lake not far from work to do an overnighter and he's rocking around with his barra, power barra, fancy. And he's going round and he's bumped into the Sticky Bates filming team. He doesn't know them all, but the way he said it to me, he said, Rich Stewart was there, Tom Gibson. He said, I think, he goes, I think they were filming Luke Stevenson, but I'm not sure. Um, and there was a couple of other people. So it was quite a busy swim. And because like the path is on the swims, he's got to go through the middle. So he comes up and he's like, oh my God, Sticky Bates are filming something. There's a great film crew. I'm going to walk through the middle of it. He goes, right, I'll just, I'll just chat to him. Popped his barrow down and was just like, you're right, guys. You know what it's like, you know, filming some fucking knobheads like, like, you're right, mate. He's just like, yeah, caught much. Doing all that small talk. I think Rich Stewart had been in the office a week before to film Blair for that. Off, Topography. Uh, for the record, off the record oh, thing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, topography. Um, and so, but Henry didn't realise this till afterwards. Like, oh, he must have like, that's why he was talking to me because he'd been in the office before. So Rich was talking to him a little bit and Henry was there, he was chatting to him and I, th- I think they just wanted to crack on, like rightly so, they just want to crack on with filming, like especially someone from another company. If they knew it was him, I don't think they knew it was him, did they? So if they knew it was him, they just wanted him to fuck off. Anyway, he's chatting away and he, he just, apparently he just sat there and he just went, so uh, what are you filming? And they were just like, oh, we're from Sticky Baits. And he just, all he could come out with, he just pointed, pointed blah, blah, blah. he pointed at his bait, his squid on his barra and it, and his barra. He just pointed at it and just went, Nash. <laughs> In his like ultimate out of rugby his, uni lad, yeah, out of his, he's a very clever lad. But out of everything that he could have come up with, Rich Stewart's got he's gone. What are you doing? Oh, we're filming for Sticky. Uh, his really... response to we're filming for Sticky was <laughs> Nash. Apparently, Rich Stewart's gone, won't hold it against you, <laughs> and he's just gone. See you later, then just picked it. <laughs> Picked his barrow up and just started barrowing off. I can see it. I and can he, see him doing And he just that. said, like, it's, as soon as I picked that barrow up, <coughs> he's told me this today. He's just going, you twat, Henry Lennon, you <laughs> idiot. All the things you could have said. And he, like, as he's walking around, like, stomping around with his barrow, like, to his swim, just so embarrassed that he's embarrassed himself in front of all these sticky boys. Like, he's just stomping around going, oh, I could have said this. I have 50 things. Oh, you moron, Henry. You're absolutely dead. And he was so annoyed at himself for embarrassing himself. Like all he could, like everything, he's a witty guy. He's funny. All he could come up with, and he goes, as I was walking around, I just realised like they had no idea who I was. I just, oh. And I looked at, when he was telling me, I was like, you just assumed they knew who you were. And he was just like, yes. And he was just so embarrassed by the fact that he'd, all he could come out with was just point at a barra, point at himself and just say, Nash. It's better they didn't know who you are. Now they know who you yeah, are. and they just looked at him, but it's like... I would have geez. stayed the other side of those boys, even if they filmed for seven weeks straight. I'd have stayed in that swim <laughs> until they'd gone. So and the best thing was, like, I think so he's, he's gone around, he's kicking himself, and he's just like, you know when you play situations over in your head, and you're like, oh, if I'd said this, I would have looked cool. Or if I'd, he said he was doing that, he was sitting in his baby going, oh, if I just said that, are oh, you more on Henry? Like, just so, um, so embarrassed. Even now, you could see when he was telling earlier, he was so embarrassed. Um... The worst thing is, like, he cracked off his deeper. Um, that <laughs> the same time, yeah, the same that same session. session, and the wind was blowing into their bank. So the next morning, uh, he had to go around and go, uh, "You're right, guys. I don't suppose you've seen my deeper blowing into the margins." They're like, "No. If we find it, we'll let you know." Man. That's horrific. So uh, if Tom Gibson or Rich Stewart or anyone that was there can remember that, please feel free to go on his Instagram and absolutely. Oh, I'm going to ring him on my drive home, mate. They probably won't remember. They're like, oh, no, nah, just some random they'll, guy who was like a field tester for Nash. He was just trying to show off. Definitely remember that. Idiot. But <laughs> Henry, oh, I can't wait for Henry's it. podcast, mate. Good that. Danny boy, you've had me in stitches. You've also entertained and informed me about I'm well inspired for Belgium. Yeah, Roll we should, on. We mate, we should definitely go. Like, I cannot wait. As soon as this lockdown's over, we'll get out of there. We'll do a bit. I've like promised this to like 10 people. So I've got a lot of trips to go. It's good, mate. It's good. Sorry. Yeah. I've like, we're coming. <laughs> Ruining those spots, mate. Yeah. Keep them baited, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now it's been mega, mate. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for watching and listening. We'll see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me, mate. Cheers, mate. We'll see you again.